Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast, episode 253. Uh, this week we have Vaughn Ponix with us. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Hello. Uh, we also have uh, Fumador. How's it going, man? You've had a lot Here's of guys. fun. How you doing? Yeah, man. Every, uh, I guess, uh, hey, everybody. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, before we get started, uh, if you guys are looking for more aquaponic cannabis education, be sure to check out apmjclass.com. Uh, we have a, a quite an extensive class now. We have uh, Marty and I have been filming quite a bit of new content lately. Um, so we'll have uh, uh, quite a bit of new info on there as well. Um, constantly adding to the class. So definitely check that out at apmjclass.com if you want to top to bottom uh, APMJ uh, education. Alrighty. Um, uh, thanks for joining us, Vaughn. Um, you're uh, someone I've wanted to get on for a little while. Uh, I know we've been playing tag for a bit uh, on trying to, to get the schedule uh, synced up. Um, you have a lot of really awesome kind of how, how to home build content for the you know, backyard grower. Someone is, you know, more than just two beds, but maybe not quite commercial. Uh, and we don't get a lot of people that kind of fit that niche, but it is quite a big uh -huh. niche for our So we're super excited to have you on and talk about a lot of the different cool stuff that you're doing because you work with, I mean, you have all different types of filtration and, and drain, um, you know, bell siphons and loop and all different types of other uh, uh, methods of um, construction and things like that on your uh, YouTube channel. It's quite a wealth of knowledge. In fact, let me throw it up here on the screen. Um, he's got a ton of awesome content uh, over here on Von Ponix. Um, so uh, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and, um, and some of the awesome work that you've been doing because you have quite the amazing little farm there. Yeah, so as you can see on the on the screen, that is my channel there. I started this channel, well, I don't know, I don't know how long ago, but I decided to get into aquaponics because my mom originally found it a good six years ago or something. She found it. We built her a small IBC tote system, and then I left for a year to go travel. And then she couldn't really get it going. So when I came back, I decided to go all out. And basically everything that you see on my channel, I collected off of Craigslist. So all of that material, I just spent a good amount of time just searching for it and was able to find it. It does add up costs, but I was able to find all the stuff used. So basically what my channel is about is, uh, is aquaponics and what I do around the garden and stuff like that. Yeah, you have a ton of great kind of aquaponic kind of aquaponics on a budget kind of con content. So it's a, a lot of great stuff. Um, tell us a little bit about your farm and kind of the layout. Uh, I'll kind of go show uh, maybe a quick... Uh, uh, yeah, what, what you're seeing there is a old view of the, the garden. So I think it was this year, or no, it was last year. My brother and I actually decided to renovate the garden, which is probably what you see in this video. Yeah, um, but basically we have two kind of areas in my backyard or three. Technically, we have a garden area where it's all the grow bit or the dirt garden where my mom grows her stuff. And then my greenhouse and the other side, I have the chickens and ducks and stuff like that. And then in the front half, I actually have a pond up front where we can enjoy and relax and watch the koi fish swim around. I am planning to convert my pond into an aquaponic system, hopefully sooner rather than later, but I'm collecting material. So that's just going to take a process and then have to find the time to actually start doing it since I do have a good amount of equipment there. But yeah, so that, that half is the, the, the garden. That's kind of old. And then the left half where you see the trampoline is where all the chickens and stuff are. And then when it's rotating around, you can kind of see the pond in the left corner. That's the pond. But again, this is a this old video, so. Let's see if we see better here to show the, the second flyover. There we go. Yeah, so there we're building the new grow beds for my mom to make it a little easier made it look a lot different. Doing this method with those bricks and the wood was actually very simple. All you have to do is cut the wood and then put the bricks and put a stake through them. 
so it made it quite easy to do. And so um, you did a lot of experimentation with different filtration and things like that. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've done in that realm, because you have a lot of content on that. My filtration at the moment isn't entirely done. I still have to work on that, but I went through a few stages on my aquaponics system. First, when I set it up, since I was collecting things new and uh, used and then stuff would just pop up and then I'd walk in and be like, oh, I can change this stuff and make it better. So I went through a few different things. So if you go to the beginning, I had originally just one tank with some grow beds and then it changed up to having five tanks where I can have multiple fish in it with three filters on each side. So the filters that I have on there, which aren't done set up is a radio flow filter, moving bed bio filter. And then the last one I still have to decide, this is on both sides. So there's a total of actually seven filters. So the one side has four filters, other side has three, which is insisting of pretty similar. The last one I still have to figure out exactly what I want to do because it's for finer particles. So probably going to put some finer mesh in there something. Yeah, you can kind of make it out in the video. Um, on the, let's see. Oh, uh, this was a recent one, yeah. Yeah, this is the latest video off your... Uh... Yeah, this one I was just showing that lemongrass that I have, which you saw right at the beginning, the thing grew quite big, but since I don't use it that often, or we don't really use it that much, I kind of pulled it out to grow something that we actually use. But yeah, you can see the filters right there. Those are three on that side. They're all conical filters, which allows the solids to settle better. The problem that I'm facing, though, is my flow is too high, which with any with gravity-fed filters, if the flow is too fast, it doesn't really allow the solids to settle. So I have to adjust for that later on. So I still have quite some work to do on it. Just got to get to it, basically. That Very took me some time to pull that lemongrass out because those roots were like a good few years of growth just there. So that was a pain. <laughs> it took, took a good minute to pull that plant out. So what type of crops do you grow? Uh, you don't see a lot of people growing lemongrass. Yeah, so I, I kind of try to grow pretty much whatever my mom wants, since that's what we'll use in the house. But also some of it is experimental. So I have Moringa growing in there. I have on the left in this view that you're looking at, you can kind of make it out. It is a curry leaf plant. I will make a video on that, but basically when my we first got it. My mom had it in a pot and it didn't grow for like three years. And then when I stuck into the aquaponics within the first six months, it was four times the size, which is pretty crazy. So just trying to grow different things because you can pretty much grow a lot of stuff in aquaponics. Just got to experiment with it. What are some of the different things that you've kind of maybe tips or tricks or interesting things that you've learned along the way? Uh, experimenting with your different aquaponics systems. I see you have some Moringa in there as well. Um, yeah. I'm a big fan of Moringa. Say that again? I'm a big fan of Moringa. Oh, okay, yeah. We try to grow that outside, but it gets too cold, so it kind of has dies down. So it's actually doing very well in this system, which is cool, except it got too big for the greenhouse, so I've got to trim it down, but it should grow. Yeah, it stuff grows like mint once it gets established. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very healthy as well. Um, so what um, what are some of the different things maybe um, that you were taught or learned or told uh, aquaponics was a certain way and then, you know, after doing your experimentation found it was a lot different because uh, uh, especially with all the different um, ways that you've set your system up, but I'd love to kind of, you know, hear what your thoughts are, on, especially down that topic. Sometimes it just takes trial and error. So when I first started, I just read a bunch and then started collecting material. I had it all just sitting out in the in the corner. I had one way to set it up. After I set it up, I walk in there. I can figure out a different way that will make it more, function better, be more effective, or uh, just perform better overall. Otherwise, in general, I mean, it's just start with something. Eventually, it can grow from there. Just how my system went. Started with a few things, and then it. Couldn't stop. <laughs> Spent quite a bit on this. Very cool. So what type of fish do you use for your system? So right now in the system, I have mainly bluegill, but I do have some tilapia, some red tilapia, blue tilapia, some Mozambique tilapia, and then some red ear sunfish. So you can see in the back view of that YouTube video, there's five tanks over there. Each of them I plan to have separate 
uh, separate fish in there. So just to try it out, the bluegill have so far done the best. I've tried the different fish, but for some reason I've struggled with that just because of the temperature fluctuations. So I built the greenhouse mainly for the bacteria in the system because the bacteria perform better when it's warmer. But I uh, find the issue that during the summer it gets too hot and then during the winter it gets too cold. And then during like September, October area, there's a lot of fluctuation in the temperature, which causes the water to fluctuate a lot. Even though I have a big system, which is over 3,000 gallons of water, it still fluctuates just because of the exposed surface, which has caused issues with the fish. But as of right now, the fish that are doing well, as I said, is the bluegill. And then I do have tilapia that I will probably move out during the winter. I have a system I might set up in my room for breeding tilapia. But otherwise, those are the fish I have at the moment. Uh, what are you currently using to balance your pH and your other uh, nutrients? I haven't adju addressed that yet. So I haven't added nutrients or anything like that. Well, actually, the only nutrients I've added would be through Epsom salt, magnesium, and then uh, oyster shells, so calcium. Those are the only things. Otherwise, I, once I'm done with the system, like really setting it up and everything, then I'll focus on actually adding stuff and having everything perform to its best ability. Sure. What um what what else are you looking to add or, or you know what do you have left before you're uh, looking to to bring your system uh, fully online? I have to finish the filters, some plumbing. I have to, especially for the summer, I'm, I'm going to set up a roller on the top for a shade cloth so I can take that up on, on and off easily. What else? Maybe maybe a, build a bigger compost system again to try to heat it. I've tried that a few times, but I haven't been successful successful with it. Um, otherwise some insulation, I still need to insulate a bunch of the tanks, but mainly it's just down to plumbing pretty much. I have to fix some of the plumbing and then redo that to get it up and running before. Yeah. Just plumbing and filtration basically. Awesome. Um, I was just looking back at, uh, so what, um, uh, what crops are you looking forward to growing to that maybe you haven't, uh, had a chance to grow yet? Is there anything that maybe you're, you know, um, do you just do media beds? I see a media beds in DWC in your video. Uh, do you do anything else? Um, uh, have you, what other types of stuff have you experimented with as far as, um, uh, you know, different configurations for certain crops? In aquaponics, now those are the only two I've done is the media and then the DWC. I have two styles of media. I have the Flood and drain, and I have some that are just constant height. The flood and drain do perform better, just because there's not as much of a solid buildup in there since it's able to fluctuate. So I will change the constant height ones out later on, just because they build up more waste in there. Otherwise, those are the only ones that I've done with. I might inside do some of the, I forget what they're called, the NFT, the nutrient fuel technique. I might try some of those, um, but later on, we'll see things go but yeah those are the cool. conical tanks i was yeah. luckily able to find those on craigslist for dirt cheap just some companies that basically like most of those filters or those tanks i got from company hydroponic companies that didn't go through they didn't use them at all and i found them and then you know did a little haggling and got them for a good price so pissed some people off but i gotta save money <laughs> all right there's another Nothing wrong with saving money, man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a radio flow filter right there. But as I was mentioning, my flow is too fast for it to perform as it should. So the slower the water is going through there, the better it is. But I did want a faster flow rate for my fish so that the water can circulate through the system more. But I will address, address that later on by doing some bypasses and stuff like that. So yeah. ideally for the flow rate, I would want bigger tanks for filtration, but I'm limited to the space. Yeah, ideally you want a, a radial flow that's approximately plus minus a third the size of your fish tank. Um, that's what yeah. I've decided with uh, doing it at a bigger scale and higher densities mm -hmm. uh, like we do in um, some of the projects that we're working on. Um, so tell us a little about, I, I see you solar wrapped all these tanks. Tell us a little about that. So as I was mentioning, my fish were, I had a problem with the fish dying uh, during like September, October area. So the idea is that one is to prevent algae growth, but also to kind of insulate it more. So there's the less heat loss in the system. As you can see also the, well, these, I still have to insulate those IBC totes. Uh, and then the, that big tank on the right, right there, kind of make it out of the corner. It's a 500 gallon tank. I do have to insulate that. But the idea of the insulation is just to 
prevent fluctuation of temperature to just allow it to be more stable during that time. Awesome. What, uh, uh, so um, you actually, you, this is a great question. So um, you've spent a lot of time kind of sourcing this type of stuff, um, you know, in less than traditional means. Um, how do you suggest people uh, do that if they're trying to, you know, uh, do stuff on a, on a shoestring budget or, or kind of do it on, on as cheap as they can. Um, what types of uh, methods have you found success in finding this type of, of gear and hardware? Uh, that often can be kind of difficult for a lot of people. I'm lucky in my area, there's a lot of people post a lot of stuff on Craigslist, so I have the opportunity to find it, but otherwise it's just time. Luckily at the time I did this, a lot of stuff popped up, like those big blue fiberglass tanks. You might see in my videos. Uh, I was lucky to find those. Another aquaponics lady or company kind of shut down. So they had those on the market. They don't have them anymore on the market. Just at that time, they were available. So it's just a matter of time and constantly searching. So during the time when I was collecting all this stuff, I was pretty much on Craigslist or other websites like Opera Up, maybe Facebook Marketplace, almost every day, just typing in different things, aquaponics, hydroponics, uh, poly tanks conical tanks, all sorts of things, just to see what pops up. And sometimes I have to drive far. Sometimes things are close. Sometimes I missed out on things. And But it's just a matter of time and constantly searching. Uh, you can, I mean, buying stuff used many times is cheaper than buying cheaper things online to make a small system. Like I can, I found like, a, for example, the I, right in the center are these three black grow beds. I got all of that with the tank and everything, which you can get on the aquaponic source. It was like quite expensive as a whole system, but I got all of that for cheap just from looking. So it's just a matter of it pops up in time. So sometimes you just got to wait, which also can be frustrating because many things I had just sitting there waiting for something to come up for me to be able to build it, which kind of make the process to take longer. Uh, so sometimes I just did jump on like the, I was going to, for one of my grow beds, I have it filled with uh, lava rock. I was thinking just to wait to see if someone would post hydrogen on there, but it was taking a good minute. So I was like, just buy this. It's cheap. Even though it's harder on the hands, I just want to start growing stuff and not having to wait so long. So sometimes, I mean, better to bite the bullet. Well, not really with lava rock. That's cheap, but you get the idea. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, we uh, we regularly work with lava rock in the in the cannabis side of things because mm -hmm. it's cheapest. You can buy a, a super sack anywhere from two sixty to to three sixty, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, yeah, on average. exactly. It's significant, infinitely cheaper. <laughs> a pallet of uh, hydrogen is going to set you back probably seven, six or seven hundred for that same amount. So, I just bought a yard of red lava rock for forty three dollars here in southern Oregon. So. Yeah, I think that's what I did. I drove up with my minivan to some place, like what half an hour away, filled it up with a ton of lava rock and drove back. So that was for, I think, a little more than that, but similar concept, very cheap compared to the hydroton. Right. Like if you bought it in like bags at Lowe's or something like that, it would be a ridiculous amount of money. So if you are going to buy any lava rock in bulk, just make sure you check with, you know, like a local landscape supply place normally has it relatively cheap and uh, it's a great option i actually feel all my systems have all my media bits are half full of lava rock and then hydrogen on the top so that way i can still have you know a nice layer on top for for young roots and and for my hands mostly um so the hydrogen goes on top and then uh lava rock goes in the bottom half and that just saves quite a bit of money on media but you don't have to um you don't have to fight the lava rock on top all the time So, um, what, uh, you, uh, what, what are some of the other different crops or maybe your favorite crops that you've grown so far in aquaponics, uh, or ones that you found have done just exceedingly well? One that I planted not too long ago is longevity spinach. Again, my mom had it growing and she wanted me to try it out. So I put it in and that thing just grows extremely well. It's very healthy. It's antioxidants. Uh, stuff like that. So that grows in there. You don't really have to take it out. It's very easy to root as well. All you have to do is cut it, stick it in either water or stick it back in the lava rock or the, the media and it just starts to root as well. Um, it grows year round. So you don't have, as I said, you don't have to take it out. That's what I like about having that in there versus other plants, because especially with the media, it's kind of a pain to rinse off all the, the uh, excess media and stuff like that. So if I can just have plants that are growing year round, 
just a matter of cutting it and then having it harvest again. That's nice. So that's expect one that I especially like. Um, other than that, it's cool to have that that curry plant in there to see how well it's doing compared to how it was originally just in the dirt. The, the conditions in the aquaponic system are just perfect for it to grow extremely well. So other than that, still got, as I said, since I haven't focused too much on growing yet, later on, we'll see what I decide to put in there. Feel free to ask questions as well. Uh, Marty and I uh, are both pretty versed on, on the uh, aquaponic side and then uh, Cascadian and Fumador are extremely uh, knowledgeable on the cannabis side of things. Welcome Cascadian actually. I haven't had a chance to welcome you or, or Marty yet. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, hey. thanks for the invite, man. Glad to be here. Okay. Welcome Marty. Hey, how's it going everybody? Uh, just, Marty, do you want to do a quick intro and uh, and then we'll do Cascadian after? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Marty or AP Meds on YouTube or on Instagram or various other places. Uh, I do the Alcaponic Cannabis class with Steve. <laughs> What's that website again, Steve? APMJ.com? APMJclass.com. So check out our teachable platform over there and um yeah how's it going everybody uh, what about you cascadian why don't you introduce yourself to everybody um yeah i go by cascadian you find me on instagram at cascadian grown um i'm an herbalist i'm a cannabis enthusiast i'm a gardener i know all the natural farming stuff i like my genetics and my breeding man um, yeah, I'm still, I'm, I'm a long time fish tank keeper, fish keeper, but I'm still trying to learn this aquaponic stuff. So um, I'm always here to try to pick up what I can and stitch it all together into what I know. Very cool. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was going to mention, uh, yeah, I definitely recognize the aquaponics source system. I used to build those. Uh, I used to run their, their manufacturing over there. Me and Robbie used to make, make pretty much everything that they ever custom cut or manufactured over there. So uh, it was pretty cool to see some of those older systems and, and you know, incorporated into your layout. I thought that was kind of super nifty. Um, yeah. uh, so um, uh, there was, what was the other thing? Uh, you know, something else on here that was super cool, and I lost track of it here. Hold on a second. I had too many links open. Uh, I wanted to pull up the right one here. Um, but uh, you, you've also worked with some uh, invertebrates, so crayfish and stuff like that as well. Um, do you want to talk about that um, or not talk about that? It's fun, too. Um, a lot of people haven't had a chance to actually work with fish yet, so uh, I thought maybe you could talk about your experiences on that. Uh, with the crayfish, I haven't had too much success which is kind of unfortunate, but um, when I've had them in there, they have bread and then just something goes off. And then I'm not sure they start, they started to die or disappear. Maybe they ate each other since I was I really, well, so I had them in one of my DWC systems underneath the plants and everything growing there. So I was thinking that they'll be able to live off of all the organic matter in there, but I don't think it worked out too well since I ended up with just a few um, after they did breed. So if, when I do get some more crayfish, if I do stick them under the DWC system, I will, definitely supplement with food in there either potato or just the, the food i'm using for my fish stuff like that i did get some australian red clock crayfish recently but i made a mistake i got it when i was redoing the plumbing and everything my fish were all fine so that i'll be fine i stuck them in there but unfortunately my nitrates were too high and it was the crayfish were a little more sensitive to that especially since they just got introduced to it which caused me to lose a good amount of those which was i was pretty pissed off because i got some albino uh red clock crayfish so I was pretty excited to get those. I just jumped on it. I saw them on eBay. I was like, I got to get these, but I, I rushed too quickly for it. Otherwise, still will we'll experiment on that later on just because I, they're pretty fascinating creatures. Do you have, um, you've done a, a quite an interesting design with your integrated pond uh, portion as well. Um, you also live in a climate where it doesn't get quite as, quite as brutal in the winter um, uh, out there on the West Coast. Um, uh, what advice do you have for people looking to kind of integrate that type of um, setup? Uh, there aren't a lot of people doing those incorporated ones, and yours uh, seems to be quite thriving. 
um, uh, from your content. So uh, what advice do you have for people looking to kind of, you know, pull those together? So talking about my, the pond or the aquaponic system, which, yeah. which one? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, maybe I misunderstood. I thought they were, I thought you had them plumbed together. Maybe the no, system. no. So they're two, two separate systems. So I have my pond, which my brother and I built. So originally there was a smaller pond in there. I traveled, came back. I was like, what is this janky little thing? So I was like, we got to build something bigger. Um, but I will probably make that, well, I'm planning to make that into an aquaponic system, hopefully sooner than right, rather than later, since California is always in a drought. And the more plants I have growing in there, I don't really have to do water changes because they will be taking all the nitrates out, just have to supplement with water via evaporation. So that is the plan. Um, so on that system, I will only do stuff that doesn't fluctuate. So I won't, if I do media beds, there'll be a constant height just because I don't want the water in my pond uh, fluctuating since I don't have a sump tank on there it will, or just be DWC a DWC system hooked up to that pond. But it's a matter of changing up the plumbing, plumbing, adding some more filtration so I can reduce the amount of solids going into the root area. Um, but that I haven't got to yet. So yeah, those two, those two are two separate systems. Okay. That was my misunderstanding. I apologize. No, that's no, good. Um, uh, so, um, what advice do you have for people that were looking to start off their own system, uh, especially if they're looking to start it off in the same kind of manner that you did? Um, what is your advice? Because you've created kind of three or four different types of systems and then connected them together. Um, so I feel like you're a great person to ask this. So say you're, you're talking to someone and they're interested, they, they watch your YouTube channel and they're really interested in trying to kind of start to replicate the stuff that you're doing in their own garden. Um, what advice do you have for people looking to kind of get started? Many times I always wonder why I shouldn't, didn't just start smaller and just stick with a simple IBC tote system at the beginning, just cut it in half. I mean, you can get those for cheap on Craigslist. That means I would have only spent maybe a hundred dollars to build a system, which would have been nice compared to what I've spent on this, which is probably 20 plus 20 grand plus just collect everything over time. Um, but sometimes I think about why I didn't do that but I got lucky also that I decided to start collecting everything. So all that stuff came up on the market at that time. But for someone who just wants to start, definitely I'll start with an IBC tote system. Those are very easy to make. They're big enough to have a good amount of fish in there not too much fluctuations and things. Um, because that also that is the problem with small systems is the smaller they are, the more fluctuations and everything, the more fluctuates, fluctuations in pH, ammonia, nitrite, nitrite and temperature, all that kind of stuff. Um, so definitely an uh, IBC to tote aquaponic system is a good size just to start off with. So that's what probably probably what I would recommend with if you have the space to do that. Otherwise, if not, you would just want to do it inside a 10 gallon aquarium with some fish in there and a little tub on top. That's perfect. Just to get your feet wet. I mean, anything works because you can, I mean, the herbs especially grow well in the aquaponic system as you probably experienced with, as well. So if you just have an indoor system with a tank and a little tub on top, uh, probably not a flood and drain system, just a constant height or some DWC at the top. Um, just grow some basil or some mint or something in there that you can use. And those will grow extremely well, fairly simple to set up and you won't have a high initial cost. That's also a problem with aquaponics compared to just doing a regular soil garden. The initial cost is quite a bit more expensive instead of just say, adding some fertilizer in the ground. You don't even have to build a grow bed just stick some fertilizer in the ground and just plant the plants compared to aquaponics, which does take a initial cost. But the nice thing is, as you guys know, that it uses less water, things grow a lot faster. Um, and I just overall, the concept is quite intriguing. Do any of the other panelists have a question for them at the moment? I'm gonna take a quick uh, break here, or smoke break. I'm such a noob with aquaponics. I don't even want to, you know, but <laughs> I like fishes, you know, it's stupid shit like that. So go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I guess I only kind of like fish though. I kind of get shit for this all the time because like, I don't, uh, you know, I don't set up like super nice environments for my fish or anything like that. You know, like I mostly just look at them as like nutrient things. So, I don't care if I'm just barely feeding them enough to keep them alive at certain times, you know, like I'm not like, I do, I do enjoy like, just like watching them swim around and stuff, it's very peaceful and calming. I think that's kind of like part of aquaponics for me is like just kind of hanging out in the grow room is so nice. Like even when you're working, you know, you have 
ambient noise all the time. You have water just sort of trickling. <clears throat> so it's, uh, um, you know, siphons turning on and off and stuff like that. So it's very, uh, brings a very relaxing element to the grow room as opposed to just like lights and plants in a room somewhere. Um, so, so that's always uh, a nice part about aquaponics, but I, I do catch a little bit of shit for not uh, caring so much about the, the fish side of aquaponics. Most, mostly, I just want them to process nitrogen and grow my plants. <laughs> but You're anti-fishist. Yeah, I guess so. I'm <laughs> not anti, though. I'm like, I'm like, it's he's like a fish fascist, really. There. Uh, that fascist. <laughs> and so really? I do, I have like kept quite a few different kinds of fish before. And I know I, I just heard you talking about it right when I got here. I understand you're going to have a few different types of fish or you already have a few different types of fish. Is that right? Yeah. And my sister, well, yeah, we'll see. Because I do want to breed the fish because I, ideally if I can breed the fish and not have to buy new fish all the time, that would be the best. So I'm not spending more money on that. Plus I'll be able to sell some of the fish for an extra profit, whether just in my local community or maybe even on eBay or something like that. But otherwise, yeah, Definitely tilapia since they grow quite quickly. The only problem is the temperature uh, during the winter. So I do plan to build an indoor aquaponics system, which will allow me to keep them in there. So we'll see. doesn't matter if get into it and whether I want to spend the money now or later. Uh, other than that, yeah, I tried crap catfish. Those are, I do have some actually. I do have some swimming in the bottom of this one in the tank. So I, that basic, well, ideally for the catfish, why I really wanted them is just to stir up the bottom. So the solids don't sit out there. They can get into the filter and be removed from there. Otherwise, yeah, the fish I have was the bluegill, red ear sunfish, different types of tilapia, things like that. I did try trout once, but it got too hot, and then it caused the whole fungus outbreak. But experimenting. Oh, you really got really to have cooler water. In order yeah. To, and really clean water, too. You know, like, that's one of the nice parts of, like, you know, tilapia or even catfish, which are good. I, I had some channel catfish, which I really enjoyed um, doing indoors, but... Um, as soon as I took them outdoors and the water started to heat up, they started um, spawning, you know, trying to lay eggs. Ah, cool. it was a small tank with like no paper. And so they just started fighting each other to the death over like trying to protect their eggs. So it be, uh, became a pretty serious problem right away. <laughs> so, um, definitely, if you do have cabin, you know, uh, any type of water temperature fluctuation, um, even just like throughout the day can start to trigger it um, uh, spawning and mating. And if there's not enough room in the tank or cover um, for them to be a little bit territorial, they'll, they'll literally kill each other. Yeah, I've, mm -hmm. seen, I've seen two tilapia kill over a dozen other fish in a tank because they decided to spawn and then just defended the eggs till they murdered everything else in the tank. Um, so, and that's one nice thing too. Hey, if you got an extra DWC bed or something, float a big net in there or something and throw your fish in there. And at least you can separate them temporarily. Uh, if you have to, you know, we've seen that plenty of times at different commercial farms where you might have a sump tank or something else that's still plumbed into the system. So you get plenty of water, but uh, you know, they're penned in away from the rest of them. Um, if you have a super aggressive fish too, like haze the shit out of them, it works. So we used to take like a, just like maybe like a 75 or 90 gallon uh, poly tank We'd sit at the end with an air stone in it and move the aggressive fish in there. And every time we walk by, we bang on the side and basically just haze them until they, you know, lost the attitude and then put them back in the tank because it works. Like, like they're just kind of like a dog, right? That you gotta like you make them realize they're not alpha. And as long as you can, you know, knock them down from that kind of mental attitude, they stop harassing so much of the other fish. The other thing I was gonna recommend to you is doing um, uh, bluegill. Uh, we had a lot of luck with bluegill and perch. Uh, so bluegill and perch tend to beat the living crap out of each other and tear on each other's fins quite a bit, especially if you get them into higher stocking densities. Um, we've noticed quite a bit if you dose lactobacillus and you dose the curds when you make your labs and you can take just the curds off, feed that to the fish, that, that actually is a strong antifungal uh, and antibiotic. So uh, when they do tear at each other a little bit, it doesn't get infected. So they don't get those uh -huh. secondary infections uh, and they get, increase the growth rate, right? So uh, you kind of get the, the two for one. So you get a, a, a fi free fish food uh, that also accelerates growth rate and um, helps reduce disease in the fish tank. So it's a 
one more reason to, to add labs to your aquaponics because we've talked about probably a hundred others uh, over the course of the last couple of years. That's neat, thank you. We've also used lactobacillus for those of you that don't know to treat E. coli uh, in commercial systems without bringing them offline or affecting mineralization cycle. Uh, so, you know, you won't lose your ability to cycle nitrogen uh, and you can still treat the E. coli at the same time. So uh, definitely something that you can, um, you know, one of those things that in my opinion, in three to five years from now, the USDA is gonna require it for commercial aquaponics just because of how cheap it is for the farmer and because of the impact it has on, you know, um, pathogens, you know, it, it's, it's too cheap and too beneficial to not use in my opinion. That's good to know. Oh, yeah, so yeah. You, you dose lactobacillus generally at a, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, um, at a one to 1000 dose rate. So um, if you have one gallon, you know, one gallon of labs per thousand gallons of system volume, it will slightly lower the pH, but you can actually use it as an organic certified pH down. Um, so if you need to lower your pH in your organic certified system, you can actually use that to bump it down without having any, you know, strikes against you or violating any of the rules. From looking at my system, do you have any recommendations on what I should do? Um, it or looks improve like it or anything a, like that. You have a pretty good, um, a pretty good layout. I think you just need to get it all plumbed up to where you're happy with it and fully recirculating. Um, mm -hmm. The one other thing I would recommend to you is maybe plumb up. Um, let me see if I can find the diagram. I did a presentation a long time ago on aquaponic tree production. Uh, let me see if I can find the presentation. Um, here it is. Ah, I found it. Two seconds. So stuff like this. So this is how you want to do your trees, except the, this diagram is old. So instead of doing 50% soil, like we have with basically a giant dual root. So this is a 55 gallon drum. And what we did was, where's the pictures? To the top of this. Oh, I might have to go dig the pictures up separate, but this is a, a presentation that we did. We, we did a bunch of work with a bunch of 55 gallon drum kits and we basically set them up as flood and drain with a standpipe. Uh, the fill was this way. It would flood and drain just the same as a flood tray with a standpipe. Anyone familiar with hydro knows exactly how that the plumbing works. Um, but what we would do is we'd chop off the top third of the tank uh, with the plastic tanks, uh, uh, 55 gallon drums. And then you can uh, take that and sit that on the ground and the bottom of this one sits nicely on top of the other one. And if you just cut a little hole, you can run your plumbing through it. So it gets you off the ground high enough to run your plumbing through the bottom and it's cheap. So you can pick these up sometimes as cheap as five or eight bucks a piece. Uh, usually they're closer to 20, but sometimes they're cheap. Uh, so you wanna set it up as a dual root zone, soil on top, uh, some type of burlap or root permeable cloth in the middle and then hydrogen or lava rock in the bottom half with a um, basically giant um, uh, media guard and uh, flood and drain plumbing kit. And it works extremely well. And um, what we found originally, we were flooding and draining these, uh, just the bottom portion. Um, uh, we do tried 50% and then 75%. So, you know, basically the soil down to here, uh, I'm sorry, the soil, you can't see my hand. Uh, the soil down to here, I think you can see the mouse, right? Um, the soil down to here. Yeah, <laughs> we can see the it's a lot better than your hand. Please. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little bit high. It's okay. Um, anyways, so uh, basically down to here for the soil and then put your burlap layer there and then just flood and drain this bottom portion and let them drink at the bottom and then top water the, the, the top portion uh, and just keep it moist, right? Put a moisture meter in here, maybe even some blue mats or whatever your preferred method is. Uh, or just hand water it um, or set it up on a manifold, whatever you want to do. But you're going to top water this separately so you can amend the soil section. And the reason why is, is because most trees, in order to produce the lignin and the other um, more tougher compounds for wood production, need to have mycorrhizal fungi and some of their secondary metabolites in order to have that happen. That a lot of trees do not do well in soilless medium for that reason. They have to have 
some of those mycorrhizae. And those mycorrhizae are in that seed, right? They bring them with them, but if it doesn't have the environment to get established, it doesn't take off, right? We, we, we tried this, um, one of the other crops that we did a lot of work with this specific issue with was OSHA root. Uh, anyone that's super into organic medicine knows what OSHA root is. It's a, a super strong antiviral. It's almost exclusively wild crafted. Um, and we were able to replicate this, the right grow conditions in aquaponics by putting them in wicking beds and allowing the soil to wick up the water into a, a set level uh, uh, in the soil zone so that we could hit the right moisture level that that mycorrhizae needed and transplant the OSHA root uh, or the seeds into that mycorrhizal layer. And they grew like gangbusters. I had them growing uh, in my showroom at the aquaponics source, like a plant that people say you can't grow commercially. We were growing half ass in the showroom, right? Like not even trying, right? So that's the type of stuff that if you look at the environment that, that the plant naturally grows in, you can replicate so many interesting things with aquaponics. Um, just like you were saying earlier, you can grow down near anything. You might have to readjust the, and calibrate how the roots are set up, but you can grow anything in aquaponics. Um, uh, we've even grown cactus. Uh, in fact, I could pull up a picture from seed. You check out on my YouTube channel, <laughs> AP Med, one of my previous grows, one of my outdoor cannabis grow got shut down due to regulation. I refilled it with other stuff. And one of the ones I did was an elderberry bush. And uh, by like year three, I want to say it was about 11 feet tall and fully producing on what even like people who grew elderberries commercially messaged me privately after seeing videos on there like what did you do <laughs> so, so this is a this is a prickly pear cactus that was grown from seed uh in a uh, uh what's it called i heart grow plug uh germinated there and then transplanted in the aquaponic system um, so you can grow even cacti in aquaponics, just to show you the extreme end of, of what you can grow. There was somebody else growing like huge cactus in aquaponics too. I want to say it was like Aloha Terps or... Was it a... a yeah, Aloha Terps was doing it. And there was a guy who had a YouTube channel that was doing dragon fruit that was doing like big dual roots on dragon fruit plants. I forget where, um, but he was having crazy production on his stuff. That elderberry was only like a three gallon pot or something. It wasn't like, you know, it was way smaller than other ones. So now, you know, obviously I use a lot bigger ones, but, um, you know, even, even with a very small dual root zone, I was able to get, you know, a, a giant bush of an elderberry uh, tree, essentially, uh, just full of berries. Actually, we had to, when we moved from one house to the other, I had to physically cut it out of the gazebo because we couldn't even move the media bed. Um, like it was just completely attached. So we had to like cut it out in order to be able to move the system. So <clears throat> with even larger dual root zones, um, I think in my uh, greenhouse system I'm building right now, which would be for larger plants, pretty sure I'm gonna go with 15 gallon pots uh, for that one um, that just have an even larger soil area where you can you know, keep all that stuff out of the out of the water table and dose however you want. It's like this uh, one. Yeah, there you go. What you're talking about? So that that's actually um, that's year two, I believe, the beginning of year two. So this would be. I mean, really, only technically, it's about like 16 months old here. I would say, and it was from a very small. Um, very small cutting just from like the Grange co-op or something like that, you know, it was like 10 bucks or something. And the, even on the tag, it says, you know, don't, you know, you don't expect fruit for three, the first three years. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you can see here, this is the beginning of year two and it's already throwing a significant number of flowers out. So we actually got, uh, I think two sets of elderberries off of, uh, off of it this particular year. And then the third year, it was all the way up through the top. So even even farther than what you see there, but um, was was when we had to cut it out to be able to get it. So there you go. 
I knew yeah, I had to try that. Huh? Had to remember which slide deck those pictures were in. <laughs> That was pretty quick, man. I, that was nice. Oh, here's, okay, so this is good. Because this is the other pictures I was looking for. They're in the same deck, perfect. So when I'm talking about that, this is a lemon tree. This is a lemon tree in the dual root zone. That same pot, the same diagram, that's how this is set up. And you can see the blooms all over this lemon tree coming in the spring. And this is a cabbage that we did dual root zone. That's a typical uh, API aquarium test kit bottle for scale. Right. <laughs> That's pretty. Yeah, we had to take the we had to lift the side of the greenhouse out to get that uh, cabbage out. So um, one of the kids of one of the employees uh, that worked for the aquaponics source uh, at the end of the school year in Colorado, they give the kids uh, I forget what nursery burpees nursery I think it is gives the kids this giant cabbage plant and they have to grow it over the summer and bring it back in the middle of August to see who grew the biggest one. Well, the biggest, the, the next biggest one from the one that we grew with her uh, in the greenhouse at the end of the, the grow bed there wasn't even the size of one of our leaves. <laughs> it, was, it was literally like five times larger than the next biggest plant. It was great. <laughs> But uh, yeah, this is a, from a presentation I did for the uh, Aquapong Association of China. So we translated uh, kind of dual root zone stuff for uh, for the Chinese uh, aquaponics club over there. Steve, can you bring up the pictures of the greenhouse? Which the current ones? Yeah, on the system I'm working on building now. Sure. So you can get an idea of the, kind of like what I was talking about, the larger pots and the same same setup because you can really put those in you know any media bed you want like even existing ones um and you know that that would be the next thing i would start experimenting with can you go to like more recent pictures half a dog <laughs> <laughs> So there we're just digging out a trench, um, which will actually act as both my drainage and my sump tank. So it slopes from one end to the other. If you just go to the, yeah, kind of skip to where the media beds are, you'll kind of see the dual root zone set up. There we're just using the water to fit the liner. So the weight of the water just helps you work it all into place. And so on this side down here, oh, you can't see my mouse, but on the, the side closest to you there is about two feet deep. And at the other end, it's about a foot deep. Um, so it's just tilted from one end to the other. And the fish will be able to swim all the way up um, and back and forth. But any water fluctuation will just sort of come off of the shoreline up here at the top. <clears throat> and then the media beds are gonna go across, which you'll see here in a minute. So you can see the media bed. So another option to like shopping around for different types of aquaponic uh, pre-made equipment is just um, using liner. You can order liner, uh, you know, like Ultra Scrim is a great liner to use. That's what you can see there in the, in the tank. And uh, it really allows you to build stuff to your own size and specification and usually a whole lot cheaper than um, like purchasing tanks um so i've been i've been doing this for a while probably since i think the last time i purchased any media bed it was you know easily twice as expensive as you know even even with lumber as expensive as it is right now it's still cheaper to buy paint and liner media beds um that are exactly the size that i want because one of the things that i find difficult is even with stuff that's made to do aquaponics is they're 
a lot of times they're not deep enough. You know, like the deepest one you can find are like maybe eight inches deep. <clears throat> so um, for the dual roots on pots, I like to have a little bit more water fluctuation. Um, and uh, so Steve, if you go ahead a couple more, you should see where we started to fill up with um, guys. My shoe pick update. Skip in. The last time we checked in, we just finished the rep. I'll, I'll mute your. I'll mute you, Marty. <laughs> no, have you done anything with fiberglass? I haven't done anything with fiberglass. Um, mostly due to cost, because it also has also has to be supported anyway. So, for the most part, I. Uh, it just has always been le the least expensive uh, to be able to go with wood and just even if, it, I mean, I guess if you wanted something that looked like super clean, well, I guess I don't have the newest pictures in there, do I? So why don't you, uh, I'll let you uh, throw up some of your stuff. Okay, hang on just a second. No worries. I didn't mean to cut you off there, Bob. I just he had a, he's got some pointers and stuff. That's good, no problem. Do you want to uh, while we're going through? Do you want to uh, plug your YouTube channel while we're uh, waiting on Marty and tell everybody how to find more information about the different cool stuff that you're doing? You want me to show my channel? Or yeah, to, uh, tell people what your YouTube channel is and, and our Instagram or what other ways to find you. Yeah, so I only have a YouTube channel. You can find me on YouTube just by typing Von Ponix, B O N P Ponix, basically, and it should be the first one that comes up. Uh, click subscribe if you want to see more videos of what I'm doing. I, as I mentioned, I will be upgrading my pond into an aquaponic system. If you're interested in doing like a pond aquaponic system, that will be coming hopefully soon which will be pretty cool. I'm excited to do that. Just got to spend some more money and collect some material. Otherwise, check out my channel. Very cool. Steve, can you enable sharing? Oh, my bad. My bad. There you go. I didn't realize I didn't have it turned on. I got to see how to turn it on by default, my bad. There we go. What makes tilapia the uh, go-to? Oh, tilapia is kind of the easiest to grow um, as far as uh, fish that you can eat and that breed on their own. So you can keep a couple of tilapia, have absolutely no idea about fish husbandry or really water chemistry, to be honest with you, in most cases with tilapia, and you'll still succeed. Like it's, they're pretty hard to kill. Um, they'll live everything from 5.8 up to nine pH, which is probably one of the widest ranges of any fish that I know. Um, uh, salinity, they can go everything from fresh water almost all the way to seawater. If you do it slowly, you can adapt them to seawater. Um, so, you know, they're, they're just super tolerant um, and you can eat them. They have a large amount of babies per year. If you separate them, you can actually get a large amount of meat production out of them, especially if you're in a poor country and you don't have a lot of other meat options, but you have water, it's a really good option. Um, uh, but um, monetarily, if you're looking to just make a buck um, butterfly koi generally are the the best monetization uh as far as that goes selling back to the pet market yep <laughs> sell back the for every inch gained you're getting significantly more dollars than any other fish that you can grow just about at least up to a certain size uh, one if you're going to grow anything out past 24 inches then definitely look at sturgeon because a, a two or three year growth rate uh you're going to get way more money with the caviar so depending on what your turnover rate, plan turnover rate is and the scale of your operation, um, you can kind of figure out how to maximize the, the fish monetization. Right. And I, I think I'm a big fan of koi, you know, just because, you know, they're extremely tolerable and they're always hold a resale value if you really need to 
pop food some, it's not a big deal. Um, and you really only need a, a pet handler's license. Uh, you know, usually if you're doing anything with fish that you want to sell for food, you have to deal with getting some sort of um, approval or license or something that ends up costing more money as opposed to just a pet trade license. It's usually a lot cheaper and easier to get. So especially if you're already having to deal with getting licensing to grow cannabis, um, you know, that's usually hard enough in and of itself. So it's usually easier to just take the cheap route on the fish, in my opinion. But you know, how, however you want to just know if you're going to take on, um, you know, trying to sell fish as a food, you're probably also going to have to have like a separate facility um, that you'd be able to have like a commercial grade kitchen and uh, pass all of your food inspections in addition to everything else. So that would be my only caveat to, to having any business plan that relied on selling fish sometimes can get pretty complicated if you're not doing it strictly for pets. Some people say they, you know, sort of go through a loophole and they sell their tilapia or whatever as live pets. And, you know, basically just the expectation is that the person, you know, takes them home and kills them and eats them anyway. So you're still selling fresh fish um, for them to take home and eat, but it's kind of under the guise of, uh, you know, that they're, they're taking, as far as you're concerned, they're taking them home as a pet. It's kind of like when you used to buy a bomb and you said it was tobacco only. You know, it was like, yeah, sure, buddy, tobacco only. You know, yeah, sure, I'm going to take this home and put it in my fish tank. Like, no, really, I'm going to cook it and eat it for dinner. So it can be a little bit of a pain in the ass to get uh, licensing for selling fish for food. But <clears throat> aside from that, here's what I was talking about. The dual road zone pots will be um, a little bit larger. I'm actually even going to go a little bit bigger than what's here. I think this is a five-gallon pot that's what's here right now. And the ones that I'm going to get are going to be 15 gallons. So they'll, they'll go pretty much all the way to the side of the media bed, but not too much. There'll be two plants per media bed. <clears throat> and then I have one uh, media bed all the way down here at the end that I'm going to use to grow uh, just food in. So I haven't decided what I'm going to put food-wise in there, but you know, usually just nitrogen-absorbing greens of, of some sort. Um, or, or even just a small fruiting plant isn't a big deal either. Like For instance, like tomatoes, you know, they'll just suck up whatever available nitrogen is left in order to create a lot of uh, uh, new, just green leafy plant material as opposed to tomatoes. So they do kind of a good job of just being like a nitrogen tank to where they'll absorb a lot of additional stuff. But there's a lot of plants that do that. Yeah, I mean, lettuce is good for that. Uh, you know, and it kind of depends. At my old house, we used to have really high calcium in our well. So I used to grow a lot of kale uh, just to help uptake a lot of calcium and help keep it in balance. So it just kind of depends on, on what you're growing. But um, this is just another kind of model that you can use if you don't want to look for existing aquaponics um, tanks uh, that you can always just sort of manufacture your own and uh, be able to do that. Usually a lot cheaper um, than doing that. It is a lot more work if you don't know how to, you know, build basic boxes. It's not difficult to learn by any means. Like I'm an IT manager, you know, not like a construction worker or anything like that. So, um, you know, you can run a screw gun, and a staple gun, you can build your own media beds and even your own fish tanks pretty easily. Fish tanks get a little bit more complicated because you have to deal more with uh, the water weight, but there's a lot of resources online that can help you, you know, look up, you know, what uh, what kind of reinforcement you're going to need to be able to hold a tank that size. You can even put in your definition, like what, what size tank you want to build. <clears throat> and it'll give you an idea of what sort of reinforcement you need for that tank. So um, usually those are, like you just Google like DIY fish tank calculator, you get like five or six different hits. And I always just use those uh, to help. But for the most part, uh, building your own stuff can be a lot cheaper and you can kind of get it just exactly the size you want and, and set up that you want. So for this system, um, you know, I went with a little bit taller greenhouse than what you would normally see. Uh, you know, you, usually people go just like eight to 10 feet tall. Um, but because I'm doing aquaponics where you can see the bed sit up a little bit higher than just uh, you know, growing right in the ground, I went a little bit taller than normal. 
and uh, eventually the light that tarp will be able to go over the top so I can control the light cycle. And, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Wanted to see how it ends up, but it'll it's designed to run 12 lamps, which is the maximum I can run here in Oregon under our medical license. Um, and so it's 10 foot by 40 foot by 11 feet tall. And uh, the tank, including the trough and everything, is roughly 500 gallons. So I kind of roughed out the math on that, but it was going to be just because it's an odd shape, so it was a little hard to tell. But even I guess made it pretty close. And then I drank, I filled this tank out of another tank so that I was able to see how many gallons it was exactly that went in to fill it. So that's a good thing to do when you're building your own tanks is uh, um, make sure that when you fill the tank originally for the first time, you track how much water you put in, and then you know how many gallons of tank you are when you're completely topped off. And then you don't have to guess at whether or not you got all your math right <laughs> in terms of how much water is in your tank. So um, those are kind of my, my tips for that. I will mix in a bunch of hydrogen that I have um, on each one of these top layers that will come out of existing systems. So even though I bought a bunch of hydrogen that will go in, about half the new hydrogen will go into my existing systems and half of the hydrogen that comes out of those existing systems will go into here so that I can jumpstart my nitrification cycle and get my beds working faster than if I just waited for those to build up. So <laughs> anytime you're starting a new system, if you can jumpstart with media, even from somebody else's system, um, it will you know, drastically reduce the amount of time it takes for your system to start producing uh, you know, usable nitrogen for your plants. So, yeah, we like to call it power cycling. It really helps speed up the whole cycling process significantly. So that's that's my fun fun little project I'm working on. And all, all those uh, videos and stuff you were we were clicking through there, all that stuff that's waiting to get uploaded to the class that Steve and I do. So we have a whole uh, build section uh, for the class that goes through that whole tips and tricks on setting up that whole greenhouse from setting the posts all the way through building the system. So check that out if you would like. Awesome. Yeah, I know um, there's a bunch of questions in chat here. Um, one of the ones I keep seeing over and over again is, is there any, any benefit to having different types of fish for different nutrients? So in general, High protein intake fish are much higher in nitrogen output than lower protein input fish. So herbivores have lower nitrogen output and higher phosphorus output than say a carnivore. So uh, you can use that to your advantage depending on what type of crop. So for instance, uh, when we grow cannabis as an example, we tend to use more carnivores if we're doing a real large facility for the veg systems where we wanna have the higher nitrogen and then use less for the uh, flowering system or even use herbivores, you know, maybe have paku or sturgeon or something else that's a little bit more of an, om maybe not sturgeon, but paku or some other fish that's gonna be a little bit more of an omnivore um, uh, for the flowering system. Koi would be a good one. So hopefully that helps answer the, that question. Someone else asked if we have rainwater catchment in our education. Yes, we do have that covered. We have a couple of, I think two different examples of that at a commercial scale uh, set up in that. Um, one of the questions we have here from chat, we have quite a few. A um, bunch of people have gotten harassed by social media this week. Um, uh, Instagram has had another bandwave and a couple of other places. So, uh, you know, be careful. Uh, uh, make sure you back everything up. I know I have everything backed up on two separate um, physical hard drives sitting to my left in case something ever happened to my YouTube channel. If you have a YouTube channel right now or a lot of content, I highly advise doing the same. It seems kind of like another wave is is out there. Um, there's something else I was going to bring up. Oh, um, well, actually, we brought that up on a few minutes show. We won't talk about that on there. Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm just going through chat here. What other questions do you guys have while I'm uh, going through here? Do you have any questions there, Vaughn? You have a uh, kind of a, a bunch of different people here that have a uh, bunch of different backgrounds on on growing stuff. At the moment, no questions, but I'm definitely going to try that dual root system. That seems pretty cool. Hooked it, probably hooked it up to the pond when I set up the that into the aquaponic system. Have you tried any wiki beds or sips uh, at all? That's really good for growing root crops and aquaponics. I haven't try, uh, done wicking beds. I do have the plan to build one. I'm going to probably make a video of cutting a 55 gallon drum in half and turning that into a wicking bed. So that is on the plan, but I haven't done an actual wicking bed yet. No. Did you grow a, uh, um, <clears throat> let me think if I remember the right name. Yeah. Wasabi, like Japanese wasabi, the actual like uh, root thing that grows in like rivers. Could you grow that aquaponically? It's apparently like le legendarily hard to grow wild or, or culture it apparently. Yeah, it, it's actually one of the best things you can grow on aquaponics. You can grow it in the wicking beds uh, as long as you, um, you germinate them. The, the trick with growing wasabi is to germinate them in the same bag that you're going to grow them in. Uh, people try to transplant them and it there's something with that that just fucks it up. When we, when we tried it every single time where we put the seeds in the actual put them basically in smart pots with, with good soil mix and, and put that into the aquaponics beds. And we put some media, maybe just two or three inches of media, and then had them just kind of kissing the, the surface of it. So it would wick up through the whole thing, but it constantly had access to water. And that was how we were able to grow them really well, kind of in controlled conditions. Um, I, obviously that'd be pretty easy to replicate at scale, um, but I haven't uh, really tried to do that yet. So but is that it's definitely one of those ones I think would be a good fallback if if the bottom fell out of the market and you were a cannabis setup, it'd certainly be a good one to think about falling back to as far as mass production. Is, so is that the difference between a, a dual root zone and a wicking bed? It's just the depth of the media, of the soil media? So the difference between the two of them is that with a dual root zone, you have an air gap so that you top water and maintain moisture levels separately through a separate um irrigation means be it hand watering or automation um, but it's it's watered separately so that that moisture level in that soil zone is maintained separately and amended separately than the flood and drain in the bottom portion whereas a wicking bed is flooded oh. from the bottom that, gotcha. that's the difference yeah and you can't <clears throat> you can't run as many wicking beds in the system as you can do a root zone because they'll start leaching back into the water table um, so because they're constantly getting into contact with it. The way Steve talked about doing it, where you have the smart pot that just you know kisses the top of the water would, would probably be best. But a lot of people, like if you just go Google like aquaponic wicking bed online, they're, they usually keep it uh, pretty wet to the point where <clears throat> I would expect that, that you would start seeing nutrients from the soil leach into the water table can become an issue so in dual root zone it's nice because you can really lift up the uh, nutrients you have stored up in there to higher levels because it's not getting into the water table at all and that that air gap lives in the lava rock like you have the layer of burlap and then you have the lava rock below it but there's a there's a gap between where the water level is and the burlap right i like about the two inches between the, where the so when you're filling your beds up uh, it gets to its highest level. I like about two inches between there and the bottom of your burlap or whatever you're using for a separator. Uh, otherwise, you can still get like a little bit of evaporative wicking. So just the um, what evaporates off of the top of the water surface will, will just keep the bottom of the pot really damp and start causing can start causing. Um, you know, like anaerobic zones and stuff like that from your soil staying too wet. So uh, for dual root zones, I even like even a little bit more space than what you see on this diagram. Like I would probably move that water line down, you know, almost almost double what it is right there, just for my own personal setups uh, and what I like to do. So I don't mind running. A, I would rather run a, a bigger or taller pot that would allow me to put more soil up above and have a, more media in the bottom of the pot itself just to make sure that that air gap stays in there because I maintain the, the like Steve was talking about, the moisture uh, 
content uh, in the soil through top watering as opposed to um, having it try to wick at a controlled rate. You can see here where the flood layer for the soil is above the, the media. But the media is high enough, just enough to, to block algae, basically. And that's it. The cheapest way to, to build them out. And just those those regular kind of nursery plots that, you, that he has up on the screen right there are my favorite. I drill extra holes in the bottom of them. Um, I don't drill any holes in the side. <clears throat> And I want my water level to come up up above to where the, the top of those notches on the side usually are. They'll usually come up about three quarters of an inch to an inch or whatever it is. And I want the water level to come all the way up above those and be able to drain back out so you get an air exchange when that water comes up, pushes air up into the soil and then pulls it back out. If you have holes coming out the side of your pot, that air won't go up through the soil, it'll go out the side. So that's generally the sweet spot is right, right above, I would say, you know, the solid, <clears throat> even an inch above those, those drain holes that already exist on the side. And I'm not a fan of um, like smart pots or anything like that, that um, they just tend to wick too much to eat. They stay wet for too long if they get wet for any reason in aquaponics and just it's not, I haven't had good luck with them and, and don't really recommend them. But uh, so far, my favorite has just been a, a good old nursery pot with a couple holes drilled in the bottom of it to help roots get out the bottom. So in this diagram, you can see here, this is the dual root zone plant right here. This one, the big ass one. And then this is a media bed only plant. These are tomato plants. <clears throat> this is the first test we ever did with this type of grow method at aquaponics source. This plant had 44% fewer flowering sites and 38% more fruit. And the dual root zone plant was, had fruit that was ready to harvest two weeks before the other plant did. So, you know, it, it's just at, almost ludicrous, the, the level of difference in production. Here's those same plants uh, when they're alive. And there's a different example of dual root zone, but you can see they're uh, quite healthy roots. <laughs> My buddy Bain, he's the um, head grow, he's the master grower over at uh, Vertica Aquaponics in Oklahoma. They're the, currently the largest aquaponic cannabis producer in all of Oklahoma. You can see those are the holes going up the side of that pot like I was talking about. <laughs> oh, there we go. So, yeah, I know you guys can't see my mouse, but hopefully Steve will point to where the slots are already in the side. So I like my water level to go up. You can actually kind of see where the water level is on that particular uh, drain right there. So, you know, that that's preferable if you have a nice open space under there. Uh, so all of that uh, all the way up till that line and another two inches or so should be full of media and then just soil up above that point. So that's... Uh, Mark, you can see right here, see the hole that we drilled in the pots? When we do this commercially, we measure with a tape measure when we first get the set of pots, we measure it down and then that hole right there is their always marker for how deep to sink the pots. They sink it down until that's at the level and that's it, because that's where the burlap is. And if you do that at the surface, that means that we know that we have that one inch gap and you can't really fuck it up. If you make it brainless, it makes it so that people can do thousands of them and no one ever screws it up. So um, the other thing is if I drew that or scratched it on there, it's just gonna get rubbed off, you know, especially at the scale that we're doing. Yeah, you don't have time for those mistakes at that scale. No, so by drilling a little hole, Makes it see there's just no way to screw up. The other thing I've done to make sure that I get all my plants at the same height is I have, because my media beds aren't quite as deep as the ones Steve had there, is I have um, some just regular uh, PVC drain lines. I think they're three inch or something like that. 
put I put down I put two of them down in my big long media beds for my indoor, um, and they just sit in the bottom of the media beds. They're connected from end to end, <clears throat> so that no uh, roots can get into them and clog them up. So I get good drainage all the way from end to end of my media bed, and then also my pots physically sit down on top of the um, of them to get to the same height. So I dig down in the media till I can see the top of those PVC drainage pipes. And I set the pot down on top of that. And I know they're all at the same height. <clears throat> and able was, to them back up. I was scrolling through this and I thought this is the funniest slide that we have in our whole class. <laughs> it's the, the goldfish wheelchairs. <laughs> I was just looking for a certain slide and thought you guys would appreciate that. You know, this is what I was talking about earlier. You know, I'm, I'm not building any fish harnesses for any fish. Like, it's not going to happen. It's not happening. <laughs> All right, well, uh, no fish treadmills? Know. Why no fish treadmills? Nope. No, I, uh, no gymnastics? If you need to get rolling, man, uh, I don't want to keep you all night. I don't know what your availability is, but I do know that uh, originally we had asked you to stay for an hour. So if you do need to take off, uh, uh, feel free to, to peace out and tell everybody how to find you again. If you want to stay and hang out, then that's cool too, man. Yeah, I'll hang out. Do you have any more questions for me? Or yeah, let's go back to chat. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, overstretching your time, man. That's all. That's cool. Let me let me run gonna... for one second. I'm gonna go close some ducks, and then I'll be back. So sure. Don't get eaten by raccoons. I want to think that he was actually he's closing ducks and not ducts. <laughs> no, I think there are open ducks. Maybe he's putting the ducks no, no. in the ducks to keep mm. the raccoons out. That's how he closes exactly. the ducks with ducks. Right. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, back. that are pain in the ass. They love eat ducks. And a lot of times they'll only eat like the neck. Like they'll just eat like the whole gizzard part. And it's like they don't even want to like fuck with the feathers or something. They're just like. Yeah. They also will get into your trash. They'll lift the lids up and stuff. But if they're lifting the lids up and stuff, and this is going to, well. I should probably not tell people this on air. Never mind. There's a good way to get rid of them that way, but <laughs> I think the uh, the bleeding hearts might get rid of them. Your PETA complains to Steve. Yeah. Comics. Yeah, I think we'll reel that one back in. But uh, um, yeah, how how you been, Cascadian? What do you got going on, man? I'm just working on seed separators. You got me interested in this tonight. Now though, I got my wheels turning, but. You gotta do some research. What's up, West Engine? I don't think we've said hi to you yet, man. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's uh, lovely to be yeah. here. Why don't you give a quick intro while we're waiting on uh, everyone to get settled again? I'm West Engine. I uh, grew up in Antigua in the Caribbean. Uh, I now live in northern Alberta. Uh, I'm a. I grow all my own cannabis. I. Do a little natural farming here and there. Um, I grow in uh, aquaponic sips. Um, yeah, and uh, lately I've been uh, growing fumidor, uh, fumidoro, seed cove, uh, uh, lime river rose. Uh, lately, what I've been Crazy. growing in my system, and uh, yeah. No, I heard that guy was kind of sketchy. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Can you guys so grow you, sturgeon uh, aquaponically? I realize I'm asking all the dumb yeah. questions, but uh, like for absolutely. caviar. I have a grow that, well, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, because you never know what the bigger ones, it's supposed to be a sturgeon facility out in um, uh, just outside of Tulsa. Uh, That's fun. Should get built out probably beginning of next year. Um, I actually just spoke to the guy earlier this afternoon, um, but half the facility is basically a giant longhouse fish house sorry about the dogs and the bones the the punishment for having wolf dogs um but there's a giant fish house down the middle that's all of the fish production and then we have the plumbing off of that and then fence line you know for the cannabis on one side and, and then a separate area for the vegetables on the other so we can centralize all the filtration and all the fish in, in one central building uh, and then run all the plumbing to the wherever it needs to go so it's going to be really cool if it all gets built out. We'll have 
uh, also a demonstration soil and hydroponic facility there as well. If, again, if everything goes well, you never know when people are planning out these facilities, but they're, they're in motion to be constructed right now. So, But uh, we will have another, um, if you guys have been paying attention to the facility out in Georgia, uh, we will be bringing that first day completely online with most of the automation by the end of September. Um, so that'll be super cool with it completely planted out and fully automated. So you guys are going to get a chance to see kind of a, what the upper end of that looks like. So that'll be super cool. The light depth just got there. So they're getting the process of getting all the plumbing down inside. And then they'll worry about hooking that up on the outside since it's kind of late in the season. It's kind of a, you know, who cares kind of thing. But they got to get it on regardless. It'd be good in case they ever had an ice storm or something to give you at least one extra layer of protection if you absolutely had to. Um, does anybody reveg after harvest? I don't. Um, too much chance of herms and fucking up a whole room. It's not worth it, uh, especially with how cheap it is to produce clones. I've done it before, but it's not my favorite thing to do. I grow in a four by four bed and a four by four tent when I flip it to flower. So it's not like I can take it out of the bed, you know? So that ties up the whole bed, but um, I usually harvest. I'm pretty conservative. So I usually harvest about half of the plant and then leave the other half to see if it revegges. If It just depends on how bad you want it, you know? Um, I feel like the same genetics, not, you know, like it, somebody like myself has done something stupid and killed all the clones of something that I want to keep. You know, I would re-veg some plants long enough to be able to get cuts off of them. But it's almost always problematic when something requires additional work than just you know, keeping clones like, like Steve was saying. So ideally, I don't re-veg anything. I do recommend knowing how to do it. And like what to expect so that if you do want to save some genetics because people do stupid stuff all the time uh, you know it's nice to know what to expect and, and kind of how to do it but uh, i wouldn't say that it's commercially viable or any like um, even uh even homegirl viable i guess i still feel like you know, I just, even if you even if you didn't produce your own clones, you're probably better off spending like, you know, the ten dollars a piece to buy new clones and start over from scratch than you would re-fetching or something. Yeah, I mean, the only scenario I could think of would be like if something was just like some insane cut that you just yeah. had in salvage. Kind of the only or, or you found fun. in you. You found you found in your grow. It, it was just so amazing that you can't let it go, and you have to reveg it. I mean, that's the only scenario I really see it working. It's just it takes longer than starting a new plant. So what's the point? And for that, you know, basically, if it is that catastrophically amazing, and you basically are like, oh my god, I cannot live without it, then I would say harvest as little as physically possible because you want to give that plant as many chances to to reveg as possible. I would think. But that's, I mean, that's one of those lessons, you know what I mean? You're going to basically sacrifice like almost all the flour. You're going to sacrifice weeks and weeks and weeks of time. So it really has to be just like next level fucking great. Because don't forget, like the next pack of seeds might have something better. You don't know. You know, like you're going to hold up time and space and work and potentially risk uh, diseases, pathogens, on and on and on, root rot, on and on, uh, just for that one plant. So I would say like if it's, unless it's like a one in a freaking billion plant, just let it go. I mean, You'll know the one in a billion when you see it. Mm. Who probably has to be the only grower that I know that just grows the same weed and smokes the same weed for years. Like, uh, he has a few other plants too. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't just have that one, but he does talk about right. Tio I mean, all like, the time. Yeah, you know, like he, and he's even said on the you know on the show multiple times where he's right. like, you know, that that's my that that's just what I smoke. I have other stuff. I grow other stuff. Like almost seems like novelty which is almost the op opposite for my experience and what i like to do and what i feel like most everyone else does which is like yeah you might be think that something is really great right now but you know six months from now you're probably going to be on something at least a little bit different or or at least a year from now um you know generally there's something else that's going to knock you, you mean you're going to move on from gelato 41 to gelato 42 that's right and that's why they have numbers mm -hmm. so you can track right. And then a few I months had, later, Gelato 43. It's a good thing there's so many of them. 
I well, we were talking for a while. I had Coots plant for a while. Um, Did you? What is interesting about that plant that could make a guy like Coots smoke it for 35 years? Am I doing my math right? I think I'm doing my math right. 30 years? 37, oh, maybe 37, 37 years. Yeah. 37 years. Is I had it for like three years. And then somebody that I thought was a friend gave me broad mites. And I lost I lost that plant and a couple other ones that I haven't been able to replace. Um, still trying to get the one back. But that plant is interesting you. because it's really allegedly. It's really like a 12 to 14 week plant. Mm. But you can pull it at eight. You can you can pull it at eight, you can pull it at nine weeks, you can pull it at 10 weeks, 11, 12 weeks. And they're all different experiences. It I I don't see a lot of hybrids these days that's more modern that has that to it it's 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 just like the intensity cranks up as you get like if you pull gmo early it's still gmo but it's a 12 so I, got a, screen. I got a question for you guys uh and i'm gonna pull myself out of this one what advice do you guys have cascadian west and fumi uh on how von Ponix could increase the flavor profiles of his plants um, obviously, you guys can't use yucca, but everything else pretty much that you guys are familiar with is fair game. What advice would you uh, guys Clearly, you got to use the most expensive uh, silica bottle, the the most the most expensive silica bottle at the grocery store, uh, the branded <laughs> one. That's the way to do it. Uh, put the maximum dose on there, the the one that uh, they say is dangerous. No. That's no, what, was the, what was the Royal Dutch one that comes in the green that's like a third more than everything else? What's that one called? You know what I'm talking about. I think there's an even more expensive one, yeah. I think there's... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Playground or something. Yeah, Platinum, yeah. Platinum, yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know that it's good because it's that expensive. It's, it's got a plant crave. It's got electrolytes. Mm -hmm. to, to, probably. <laughs> I would imagine it has electrolytes. For that kind of money, I would hope that it has electrolytes. Um, but what I advice would, would you guys have for, for, uh, for him? Because uh, I'm kind of curious on that. To hear kind of y'all's take on that kind of topic. I mean, I, I'm struggling to figure it out because aquaponics is so different, but I feel like you guys, especially like in a dual root system, you still do have kind of a soil system. So I would say like, if you don't have like uh, worms and worm castings and stuff, I would throw down worms and worm castings. And I would assume actually the worms would love that situation because they love to kind of fuck around in moist areas that are not too terribly moist. So I would imagine like they'd just be freaking going gangbusters right at the, like right at that transition zone that Marty was showing. I bet they would go fucking nuts. So I would assume that would be awesome. I mean, we have, you know, I have red wiggler worms in all, all my systems, media beds. You almost, like, almost once you put them in, you almost can't get them out <laughs> in terms of that, that's how much they like the environment. And really, um, the, the red wiggler specifically can survive in really aquatic environments as long as it's aerated. So they have no problem colonizing media bed and eating solids or you know, doing uh, a, a number of different beneficial things. Um, like you were saying, right in that that layer, also. So um, I I put them in my dual root zone mix. I put them in my media beds. I feed them with my fish. Um, I use them to break down, uh, you know, like in in worm bins to be able to break down our food waste. And, you know, turn it back into a mix that goes back into the dual root zone media, and even the the water that leaches out through the worm bins we use to add back in. Um, the aquaponic systems as well so worms are a, a great dovetail for any aquaponic system how could you so I, obviously it, it makes sense how you would do this in a dual root zone but in a, in a traditional aquaponics zone or setup uh where you're you're planting in hydrogen if you wanted to plant say a cover crop if you wanted a, a grass a legume, a root mix. Are, are you stuck with starting everything in like iHort plugs and then plugging them into the system or? Um, so you can broadcast seed directly into media beds, but you're going to go from like a, 
like in iHort plugs, you're looking at like a 97 plus percent most of the time, depending on what it is that you're growing. Uh, if you broadcast seeding, you're looking generally in the 75, 68 to 75 percent range. So some of those microbes are breaking down those seeds before they get a chance to germinate, um, which is the downside to that. Or, you know, you have arthropods, you have amphipods, you have uh, seed shrimp, you have all different types of things that just break other fish waste down, other things down that are part of the ecosystem that just consume it before it gets a chance to germinate. I broadcast seed, anything that's cheap seed, basically is what it comes down to, you know, like my watercress. Watercress is a great one, or spicy cress, any cress, really. Um, I really like, uh, we, the kids really like the um, sunflower microgreens, so we were doing a lot of those for a while, and they have, you know, pretty hardy seeds, and I had really good success rate with those. Uh, broccoli microgreens, just broadcast seeding. So what I do, you know, we talked about how you have that two inch uh, gap between the uh, water, top of the water and uh, the dual root zone part. Well, if you go down to it, just outside the dual root zone pot, just in your normal part of the media bed, if you dig down to where that same two inch layer is, then that's where I broadcast my seeds. So I do lower the top of the media a little bit and get down to where it's always damp and in that two inch section right above the water. So not all the way in the water. I find that I don't get as good a germination if I let them physically touch the seeds all the time. But if you have it just above the water level, I just sprinkle them out, kind of roll it around a little bit to work them down in there just a little bit and then just let them sprout. And then once they sprout up a little bit, I just kind of move the media back in to fill it back in. Um, and that's how I do all my microgreens. Um, anything that I do that would be, you know, cover, cover crop-ish. And I don't think that, um, and the reason I say ish is because, you know, normally cover crop, you know, gets into like other sort of like nitrogen consuming. We don't want it to um, have, you know, like, our nitrification process is already happening in the aquaponic system. So we're looking for plants that draw nitrogen out into leafy materials that we can then harvest as opposed to, you know, like something like a, a chop and drop style um, cover crop situation where you would cut it and just let it go back into the system. In this case, I generally use it as something that I, I consume so that it's pulling nitrogen out out of the closed loop system and not continually building up and being a problem for my plants that are in flower. So that's that's generally my uh, you know sort of my routine for for doing you know something like a cover crop. I don't know if it um, kind of I'm kind of surprised that that kind of thinking because Marty and I use it all the time, but you don't really hear people in soil talk so much about planting a large amount of leafy greens kind of at the beginning of flower a couple a few weeks into flower to suck that nitrogen out of the soil uh, to try and help reduce that nitrogen going into flower and you know change the balance a little bit um, we do it quite a bit in aquaponics and, and it's easy to see and test out maybe that's the reason why we you know try to screw with it a little bit more but um, it's something that you know people talk about cover crops and everything else but they don't talk about you know when to plant them or planting them at specific times for specific reasons. And something I always kind of wondered more on the soil side, maybe one of you guys can, can answer that a little bit. Cascade, you probably know more than anybody else. Uh, I can't answer with my cannabis community hat on, but um, there's, there's probably two or three times in a year that a, an actual like field farmer would plant a cover crop. Um, just depending on what they're going through, which is why I was interested because I, I was I was chasing a rabbit hole about the because I don't know much about aquaponics, but the existence of mycorrhizal fungi in aquaponic systems. Oh, yeah. And by having that cover crop in the system, you have these three or four different plants that are just there for the the ability to like be alive. They're just there to keep things in place and alive and working while you do your gardening or farming alongside that. 
but it gives those root interactions and that structure for mycorrhizal fungi to be established. So I was just wondering, uh, I was, I was wandering down that rabbit hole, but, um, from the soil side, I've, I've only grown the cannabis plant indoors and I've only done it in four by four tents with four by four beds. Well, basically I started with 150 gallon smart pots, but, um, I tried living cover crops, but I had the timing off because I didn't know then what I know now. But these days, all I'm doing is a mulch. I'm not doing an actual living cover crop just because it's easier to manage due to this, the constraints that I'm in. But if I was to play in a greenhouse in soil, I would most definitely run cover crop blends um but i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily start it when flower started because i i would start it earlier in the spring and i would grow one underneath the cannabis while it grew and then i would grow something different once i harvested the cannabis for the winter crop basically the the winter cover so there would be two different phases to the cover crop for soil in a greenhouse there would so be. Would, Go ahead. I was thinking like you uh, chop the plants, you know, maybe right before switching into flowers, so that you have this fresh, new growing seeds. They're going to be a little bit more aggressive on nitrogen uptake uh, going into flowers. So um, maybe not so much not having them through the veg cycle, but kind of refreshing them going into the flower cycle. Uh, maybe is a better way to put it. You you could simulate um, grazing definitely at that that time basically just chop everything so it's got six eight twelve inches of, of growth left take everything off above that uh if you're into the natural farming that's perfect material for a ferment especially if it's the right blend of cover crops and then yeah it'll, it'll like simulate grazing the cover crop plants will go through a phase and then they'll start to grow again and it would buy you that that you know, that soil experience you're, you're thinking of. Um, what other uh, questions do uh, you guys have? Uh, could, could I jump back and do the, uh, the terpenal, terp, uh, terpenal expression one uh, that you asked there? Uh, the couple things I thought of were um, IMO and JMS inoculations, um, microbes bring the stank. Uh, also, uh, fermented seawater. I noticed that fermented seawater, when given foliar to your plants, they give more. They seem to give more color and more flavor. Those, those would, be, those would be the things that I would. Say How do you get that, fermented um, seawater in freaking uh, inland Canada? Do you get it like? Well, salt, what uh, what you do is you have like your buddy on the coast mail you a fucking mail you a couple a uh, couple of jugs. Like a flagon of seawater. Some pounds of flour for some pounds of seawater. And more like an ounce or two, but <laughs> um, no, no, allegedly. Uh, so what you can do is if you actually do want to try and make um, fermented seawater, because a lot of people ask this for KNF, you can actually just buy sea, you know, regular old sea salt and mix up your own salt. Um, and you can buy a, uh, um, oh, what's it called? Um, specific gravity meter um, hyd hygrometer. Um, you can buy one over at uh, any saltwater aquarium store. So any specialty pet shop will have probably eight different models that you can buy or buy a refractometer if you really want to be accurate. Um, and then you can test your bricks levels too, you know. A beer making or wine making place will have a hydrometer too. Yep. That's another great point. Have you guys messed with the powdered lacto at all? I, I someone recommended that to me the other day, and I had never. It's not something I've screwed with yet. Never even heard of it. I I wouldn't see the reason to. Yeah, it's so easy uh, to make. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll go grab mine. Hold on. I used to be really into foliars. I don't know. I was. Uh... I don't know. What do you guys think about, like, just as this little side note here, what do you guys think about foliars? Do you, do you think that they really do make a gigantic difference? Like, I, I, I had this I thought, thought like, did, oh my God, I'm adding so much did, to the I... plants, and then... Go ahead. 
I, I thought I thought they did. I thought they made a huge yeah. difference, but then I was told yeah. otherwise, so I, I've kind of cut back on them. It kind of depends on what it is. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think that that really probably depends a lot on what growing method you're using. Also, like I could see just um, like I I had I had great responses from aloe foliars. Um, Obviously, the pesticide fungicide stuff works, but even though aloe, uh, aloe is super good against powdery mildew, the salicylic acid is just super boosts the leaf structure. Yeah, the aloe, there's a drastic difference, even if your plant's healthy and happy and you give it a, an aloe foliar, you'll still see a difference. It still goes up a notch. Uh, when I was not so sure of what I was doing indoors growing Epsom salts would make up nicely for the magnesium deficiency, but that's a pretty particular one, but they did work. Um, some of the really salt... Langbonite's another good one. If you want something else that's also organic certified and need to add potassium, kind of like uh, Epsom salt plus potassium and you can get that on recertified. But Down yeah, like the, the the natural ferments probably have a bigger impact than some of the more conventional stuff that we might have been introduced to when we started growing, depending on how long you've been doing this. Um, there's a lot of There's a lot of potential to alter the profile or the expression of the plant through some of the natural ferments though. So. Shout out to Cascadian for showing me this website. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, check out Dr. Deuce Phytochemical Ethnobotanical Database. Um, you can type in things like potassium. What's the, what's the Latin name for bananas? because I'm sick and tired of people saying you can firm it for napkins. Anyways, um, so you can sort by average parts per million or highest parts per million um, and then look at the different types. Fucking wild of lettuce, lettuce, man. Wild lettuce is so cool. Yeah. That's the top one there. That. Yeah. And notice that it says sativa. So the next thing I'm oh, gonna... bro, that's the, that's, the, that's the one that makes you like uh, uplifted, bro. That's the, that's the lettuce that you eat before the rock concert, bro. You need the I lettuce indica that. for uh, late night. I want that Popeye I'm, I'm spinach. They just put it in his pipe and just fucking uh, clobbered everybody. Chinese That's cabbage. Probably sativa. Yeah. A, a brassica is the highest. You got to be careful with fermented brassicas because they can fuck up. They can screw up your mycorrhizae. Um, a lot of brassicas have exudates that actually kill mycorrhizae, so you got to be careful. Yeah, they they actually don't interact with the mycorrhizal networks in the soil. On, on a positive note, they don't. Certain, certain species actually, so the city, the state of California actually documented, um, I forget what species of mustard, one of the more common species of mustard in California actually actively kills mycorrhizae. And that's one of its methods of, of eliminating competition in the, in the soil zone. Um, uh, so you gotta be careful with brassicas. Not all of them do it, but some of them are very non-beneficial to your soil, especially. Yeah, I was, I was taught to rotate my brassicas, but don't rotate the brassicas through garden space where you grow other vegetables because they there's no point. You're killing your mycorrhiza. Yeah, but it's cool if you're looking for different uh, ethnobotanical compounds or other wonderful things, depending on your level of hobby uh, ethnobotanical research. Uh, you can find a lot of cool stuff out on this website, depending on uh, how deep down the rabbit hole you are. One other book, I guess, on that. Uh, yeah, that website's awesome, though. Dr. Duke, James Duke, I do believe, worked for the USDA for like 30 years. And this is the summary of all of his research looking into I think originally it was plant compounds in relation to human health. And this is basically the summary of all of his work. A lot of the notes that are for the different compounds on the website are actually um, from his notebooks, from his 
his own research. You'll see the references up on the side when you're looking at that website. That's sweet. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look at that site because uh, I'm gonna use that for um, targeting my JLFs, so I can put what I want in the flower and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah it it yeah. helps when you're trying to make like a a particular uh, nutrient rich ferment. It's yeah. pretty pretty powerful for that. If you're into the more recreational side of things, this is like another good companion to that database. <laughs> One of my favorite books. Covers, I got right? a, a copy right here. <laughs> I need one of them. It's a damn good book. Um, it's a great tool. Though. It's awesome. But yeah, so so just so what well, just so everyone understands how to use this database that we were just throwing up here. If you're looking on what to use for ferments or, um, you know, hey, I, I have certain plants near me and I've identified what they are, you can look up what kind of mineral composition they have for, for making compost teas or composts or ferments or whatever, so that you can kind of target plants to balance out your nutrient levels uh, utilizing this database. That's, that's kind of the purpose of us showing you this and kind of how you can utilize it to, to hone in your garden, just in case you were you know, not quite sure what we're showing you for. We're showing it to mess with people. Yeah. It's for, uh, to, to, well, you're messing ends. with me. I could, I mean, yeah. I could pull Mulder's chart and we could really start mm. fucking. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to pull it up only in, uh, Swahili or in, uh, Esperanto. Here's all you need, but you got to learn Esperanto first. <laughs> Go chance that. Pretty funny. So the next thing I want to try uh, is like a cover cropish kind of thing in my uh, media beds in the greenhouse is um, purslane, rose locally. Hmm. And it's like a like an edible succulent, basically. Um, made it to the area, grows super well. And I have a friend who um, uses them to cover his entire like footprint of his plants for his outdoor plants. So he has big boxes. I think they're like 10 by 10 boxes or something like that. And like one huge plant for and the entire, I, I, everything that's not cannabis in a 10 by 10 area is just completely overgrown with just parsley at this point. So he weeded it to the point to where it would take over and then he just replants the cannabis plant every year and has phenomenal results <clears throat> so that's the next thing that i have slated i'm also going to try to grow some mullein um in the aquaponic system i'm not sure which one that'll be but uh well, plant a, you're talking about mullein mullein yeah yeah plant a lot of seeds and expect very few plants so it grows everywhere around here it's like um you know, yeah. perfect environment for growing it. I haven't tried growing aquaponics before. I grow a bunch of it in the yard and actually I've sort of um, gotten a mini following for a, a while ago. I rolled a mullen wrap um, on the podcast and it's like one of the most questions I get about is, uh, oh yeah, you're the guy that rolled, you know, does the mullen wraps. And I posted a few of them on my Instagram. I actually use them for, you know, like uh, it really helps clean out your lungs. You know, I don't know if you know much about mullein in general, but it's, uh, you know, sort of a natural expectorant and does a great job for, for doing that. Um, you know, it's even uh, has some antiviral properties and uh, people have been smoking it uh, in, in smoking mixes and stuff for a long time. And so one day we, you know, we have this mullein that grows in the yard and it just has these big, long, beautiful, huge leaves. And, uh, <clears throat> So one day I just decided instead of tearing it up and just adding it into a joint like I normally did, I would just use it as a wrap, sort of like a, a hemp wrap or anything else. And uh, works great. I do it on a regular basis now. And uh, add it regularly. So when we got... One it's one traditionally one. in the uh, smoking blends because it's, it's what they call a niter. Um, 
it coals, so you don't have to continuously relight the bowl. It's the part that keeps the ember. Right. But the the lung effects, it repairs the cilia in your lungs, which are the little hairs that move the gunk up. So when you cough, you actually cough something up. Right. That's more available and active through like a tincture form or a tea form than it would be through a smoking form. Um, Cause you're actually degrading the compounds that perform that action when you light it on fire, but it works well, at least from a bronchial health sort of way when it's uh, made into a tincture or a tea. The, the reason I mentioned that originally, though, was because it's it's notorious for not growing where you want it to. It kind of gets a mind of its own and will pop up where it likes to. It's all over the place up here, too. But I've got a couple 40, maybe, babies in my bed outside. That um, I had one plant last year. It grew like six feet tall. I left it there. I guess it was the year before that it flowered last year. They're on a two year cycle, right? Yeah. It flowered last year. Right. I chopped it down after it was basically dead and I laid it in the bed mm -hmm. and I was like, cool. I, I shook a bunch of the seeds out where I was like, I, I hope it grows over here. And then I laid it down on the other side and all of the babies are growing on the far end on the other side. There's nothing growing where I wanted it to grow. Right. Um, but I've heard from some indigenous people who have tried to cultivate it. And I've heard from my herbal professors that it's, it's just notorious that it doesn't show up where you want it to. It's kind of got a mind of its own. Um, so good I've, luck. Uh, but, I've had pretty good luck growing it in the garden, just in kind of loosely disturbed soil. Um, it, it doesn't like compact soil. It doesn't like to be on the surface, but if you kind of, you know, it, it, if you always look where it is, it's always like on the side of a road or a hillside or someplace that's kind of been recently kind of semi-disturbed. Disturbed um, sites, yeah. 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 So it seems to, to grow a little bit better that way. But um, for those of you that don't know, here's two pounds of it. Um, the leaf? Um, yep, oh, the leaf. But what you can do is you can take the leaves off, dry them, and then you can crush them up or use them as a smokable. Uh, and it's a bronchodilator, antibiotic, and antiviral. Um, the natives used to use it to treat pneumonia. Um, I used it to open my lungs back up once I got COVID. My girlfriend did too. Uh, worked super, super awesome um, in terms of that. We've given out a, a ton of it for, for helping people breathe a little easier when they have different lung issues. Pneumonia, bronchitis, we had a bunch of people. Um, that, uh, in fact, a, a coworker of mine that never doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't do anything like that. Uh, he actually, I got him to, to take some mullein and it treated his seven year chronic bronchitis, um, and doesn't come back anymore. So it, it's, you know, got a long track record. The, one of the reasons why it is so widespread, it's actually from Europe, but, uh, many of the different European colonists brought it over as part of their medicine cabinet, right? You can pack the, uh, the leaves into a wound as an antibiotic and, and, prevent infection. Um, the natives used to mix it into their war paint uh, as part of, uh, along with yarrow to prevent infection in case they got cut or scratched or shot with an arrow or hit with an ax blade, uh, it would prevent infection. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's got a long, long tradition of being used as a, a medicinal, uh, not only by uh, Europeans, but also by, uh, you know, people that lived here long before the, the Europeans came. I thought I had a jar of it, but it all got turned into tincture. So, and what you can do is you can take the buds off and put them in mason jars and steep them in sunflower oil and make a powerful um, uh, salve. You mix that with uh, uh, coconut butter or some other um, you know thickener uh, and a little vitamin E, and you can make an incredibly powerful salve that'll you know help uh, prevent infection for quite a wide range of different skin ailments. The uh, flower, when the yellow flower opens, those are traditionally picked and put in olive oil for eardrops, for earaches and things like that. It's a pretty cool plant. There was something that you could do with the root too, but I don't remember what it is right now. I don't remember the use. Pretty sure it was a tincture.
have you seen the the subspecies i think it's spiria where it'll have a whole uh like that one yeah it'll have a whole cluster of flowers instead of a single stock yeah you know, awesome. something I've been thinking about with the uh, cover crops and stuff and speaking of these kinds of herbs and spices and all kinds of fun stuff is uh, honestly like uh, uh, having a broad diversity of uh, shit growing in the soil. So, for example, like if I, if I could, if I had a greenhouse, I would love to have like just a, a, a bed of random flowers and herbs and whatever with cannabis planted in it. And the cannabis would basically outgrow uh, everything else. And then a lot of stuff would die off. Some stuff would stick around. Uh, I think the, um, I don't know, microbial colonies would be super rich as a result of that. Even more so, I guess, with the aquaponics, but it would just be like a next level thing. I don't know what you guys figure. One of the ones that I would always encourage somebody to add if they're going to add an herb to their garden is uh, calendula. It's a, it's a nice home for a lot of different beneficials. So you'll get the right bugs showing up to the garden and it's a pretty hardy plant but it's also pretty small so it doesn't take up a lot of space and it flowers for most of the year those ones that are orange with the red centers are my favorite but um i have just regular calendula officinalis seeds that i've both collected from the university that i went to but also bought some from strictly medicinal um they uh, they do have like ornamental varieties that have been worked and turned into more stable lines or more showy lines i don't necessarily grow those or have those and i'm not sure that they work the same but i don't see why they wouldn't they're still the same species of plant most people I, would know that as uh, marigolds yeah marigolds are neat they're more of a trap plant like a rose bush a rose bush is another. And calendula are the same, aren't they? Is that not right? They're not the same, like genus and species, but they look pretty I'm similar. Sorry, it's, you're right. It's marigold and pot marigold. That's my yeah, opinion. yeah. Common names suck. <laughs> when you really get into the depths, it, common names make it hard, man. At least it explains my confusion. But yeah, they're called the pot marigold. They're different from marigold marigolds, though. They're not stinky like marigolds. I've found um, marigolds themselves. A lot of people recommend them for gardens, but marigolds actually attract spider mites. They do not uh, dissuade spider mites in any way and will actively breed them. So, Which one? Uh, marigolds. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, there are lilacs famous for that too. Like lilacs just are breathing, breeding havens for spider mites, they, I think. They actually sell spider mites in most garden centers under the brand name um strawberry root starts <laughs> Why? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah uh marigolds and roses are uh trap plants so they're the plant you put in the garden and that's the one you watch because if that one gets anything wrong with it you spray the whole garden as a preventative because they show the signs first they'll put roses at the ends of vineyard rows so that they just have to drive down the rows on a daily. Now, you still want to obviously walk through the vineyard, but when you've got 80, 80 acres of vineyard, it's kind of hard to do every day. So they'll put roses on the ends so that they can just drive the ends of the rows. And if any one of those roses looks funny, they spray like those three rows um, as a preventative because the roses show the signs first. On, uh, on that particular topic, um, I did want to give a shout out to Velifer. Um, we've had incredible luck the last two or three months using Velifer at a couple of different spots on quite a wide range of different pests just to kind of see what it works on. Um, and it's stopping damn near everything we throw against it. So um, definitely a product. If you aren't already using it at a commercial facility, you should be using it. Uh, it's called Velifer. It's a very hyper aggressive strain of a very Bassiana. It even works on leaf hoppers. Uh, which is one of our banes, which can vector a wide range of fungal and, and viral diseases. So um, definitely uh, something to, to keep in the wheelhouse if you're not uh, currently using it.
there's always a decent population of the uh, minute pirate bug in the calendula. But I've wondered if that was because of the presence of thrips in the calendula. Well, doesn't, doesn't calendula have quite a bit of pollen output as well? Memory serves me correctly. It is quite a lot of pollen in those flower structures. So remember that mm -hmm. uh, uh, aureus will feed on pollen as a backup protein source if they do not find enough insects. So by having the calendula there and having that high amount of pollen production, it kind of gives them a backup food source when they can't find meat. Yeah, the other one, now that you say pollen production that I would I have oftenly recommended to people is the uh, if you're in a greenhouse or if you're in a warmer setting, keeping uh, the ornamental variety of pepper called explosive ember. There was a white paper that came out uh, several years now that evaluated different pollen sources for the husbandry of predator mites. Uh, and explosive ember was top of the list. A close second was cattail pollen. But uh, the thing about the explosive embers is that they have both the pollen source and the extra floral nectary. So they have a, a nectar source and a pollen source for the predatory mites to, to live on. Uh, but nutritionally, they, they led to the greatest breeding environment for the predatory mites. So that's also, another. The other cool thing about this stuff, it works from um, four centigrade up to 40 centigrade. So, um, and 20 up to, you know, pretty high. So you have a, a pretty wide range of uh, a use on this. Um, and I, again, I, I've not seen it anything else work on on the simple range that this stuff seems to knock back every pretty much everything we throw at it. Um, I've just not been happy. And I've worked a long time with Bavaria Bassiana. Uh, I've never worked with this particular strain before, strain uh, 5339 or PPRI 5339. Um, but holy crap, is it awesome. Um, I do not believe it's approved for field use yet, but it is approved for greenhouse and indoor. So um, use appropriately, obviously. Um, but uh, definitely one of the best products I've seen come out recently. Uh, and just, again, can't recommend it enough. And it's safe, you know, it's, it's a fungi. It's a very bassiana. It's not going to hurt you. Although I do believe the very bassiana is currently restricted in Cal Colorado, right? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I do believe it's restricted in, in Colorado. And Marty might know that. This is because they believe that it can affect certain types of bees, right? Oh, that's right. Colorado is a bee. Yeah. So that is one thing with Bavaria Bassiana. And same thing we in previously mentioned IPMO. Um, and it, um, the, uh, the wild caught, caught um, pest management um, uh, fungi that we basically had to make our own Bavaria Bassiana. Um, be careful using that around bees. Um, I will find the, uh, I took some pictures the other day. We did an application outdoors near a, a vineyard. Hold on, I'll find them. I got it here in a second. Um, so be careful. Here it is. Yeah, okay. So be careful using the stuff around bees. And this is with um, beneficial fungi that we collected. This isn't a purchased product. And also keep in mind too, that, I mean, I've only observed this a couple of times because I don't have lady bugs in my grow very often, but it, the strain that I got that wasn't supposed to affect ladybugs definitely did. I got some pictures of it. I think I sent it to Steve also. Um, and so the only thing we came up with is like maybe it died first and then somehow infected it or something like that, or you know it, it could just affect other types of bugs besides um, that. So it's just a good reason to like keep an eye on the area that you're treating. Just like Steve found this this bug here and was able to take pictures of it, just knowing um, 
how, how it can affect it. Again, it's a natural occurring fungus that's, you know, evolved to break down that insect matter. It's not really anything that's outside of its job, but you do want to make sure that you're not, you know, wiping out entire colonies of bees with your application of the sun of the day. Sorry, and um, but via yeah, again, Delifer, I can't recommend it enough. If you aren't using it currently, you should be. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, I think we'll start to wind things down. Uh, Cascadian, what do you got going on in your realm? Uh, are you working on any cool projects right now? Uh, the seed separators are taking up a majority of my time. Um, I'm going to start, I don't know if writing is the right word, but organizing the knowledge that's floated my way into some sort of a compendium or a book. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, the, the breeding projects in the, in the room. It's, that's probably the most of it for now. Um, Talking about um, something kind of like this? Or a little bit different? Uh, a little bit different. So what's, what's do you have any examples that you could show us or do you? Uh... Yeah, there's an Instagram. If you, I don't know if you want to pull it up, you want me to pull it up, but it's just Cascadian Hort, H-O-R-T. Um, it runs with a, pretty much a, a souped up computer fan. It's a AC Infinity, one of their larger fans on one side of it. And then we'll see here in a second. Yeah, down a little bit farther, there's a picture of some of a complete one. There you go on the left. Yeah, there's a couple pictures on that one. So the, the fan blows into the unit and then the top you can feed the material into the air flows through the machine from left to right. And in those two chambers, the seeds are sorted from the chaff. The seeds fall down on the left and the chaff gets blown over to the right. And you've got two little drawers to clean out both sides, harvest your seeds and clean out the chaff. Um, you got, your seed, got your seeds in your pre-roll. No, <laughs> <laughs> the, the fan is a variable speed fan, so it's not a it's not click, click, click with set um, inputs. So you can really fine tune it for whatever seeds you're trying to sort. Uh, I designed it because I'm an herbalist and I grow a lot of different plants that have a lot of different size seeds that are in different types of chaff and having that speed control is pretty much essential because you need different amounts of air to separate different size and different weights of seeds. So it should pan out to be rather versatile over the years. Um, yeah, I, I adapted the idea from um, canary bird breeders basically out of spain they you know i'm sure you can imagine in bird breeding uh, you got to save money and one of the best ways for them to save money is to sort out the eaten seed from the clean seed so that they can refeed the clean seed to the birds that they're breeding and this type of design is what really facilitated that cleaning and we're essentially doing the same thing when we clean seeds out of plant material so um, I looked at the elements of their design came up with decided on the dimensions of a unit that I wished to build and then modified the design through a couple prototypes until I had a unit that functioned the way I was thinking so 
the, the dimensions and how it looks now is is my work, but the the design itself, the original concept comes from Canary Bird Breeders. It's basically uh, that's basically how those Easy Seed works. The Easy Seed machines work as well. Sometimes they're a little bit more complex, but um, that's the same principle. That's why they have the fan on one side and the two drawers in the bottom. So I just gave it the the uh, acrylic window so that there wasn't any secrets. You know, it's not a big old mystery. And that, it's kind of fun to watch. It's kind of important for different size seeds to be able to see what's going on in there. But yeah, it works pretty well. There's two videos to this clip. The first one was the, the first half of the bowl. The second one was the second half of the bowl. And uh, I got a little overzealous on the second half of the bowl and cranked the fan up too fast, too quick, and blew a bunch of shit over to the other side. But the, the important point of it all was that there wasn't any chaff in your seeds. There's very little chaff in the seeds, but there was some seed in the chaff because I got impatient. Yeah, but you could just pour that chaff side back in again and do it a second time, right? You could just yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. It's an easy fix. It's just my impatience filming it. You know, I got a little ahead of myself. But everything always works perfect until you turn the camera on. Marty and I know this probably more than just about anybody. I know that's Fumador right. too. In fact, Fumador had a pretty entertaining. Uh, scavenger hunt at, his, uh, at a grow he visited the other day and a whole bunch of other fun stuff so you never know what you run into yeah right there is where i blew it all over you just watch it all go to the right <laughs> do you think that's bad try putting on a, a two-day virtual aquaponic conference wow just like so many different connection issues and like <laughs> Those are some of the parts i picked and i had to retweak the design and that's really cool. It, they're, they're a lot of fun, but they're a lot of work. That was a table I built for my girlfriend. And I put nice. it in her greenhouse. In that picture, you can see all the uh, vegetables we started this spring. Every six pack was a different variety. <laughs> we filled the whole garden table. <laughs> Very cool, man. Yeah, and that's I'm starting to actually get it figured out there. I can actually replicate it and then I got it down a little bit better. And now I'm working on about a dozen of them. I'm trying to release a batch of them every month. Anything more than that's a little bit too much work for me, but um, one batch a month's pretty good. I'm just trying to actually nail down the hours that it takes to build as many that I can in a month so that I can figure my time input versus my output versus the amount of people that keep asking me for one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's definitely been um, nice to have the support. I've had a lot of people in the community support me to help get me started and talk about it and mention it and give me moments like this to babble on about it. Um, and it, it really helps. I usually get at least a couple hits from every time that it gets mentioned. So it's been nice to, to be supported and to be able to not, uh, not feel like I'm leeching off anybody. You know, I don't, I don't feel grimy by, by selling them. I actually feel like the, the exchange is fair for both people. Um, so it's, it's nice to, give out a decent product for a decent price and actually be a decent person about it because there's a lot of slime in, in our community and it's nice to not be a part of that but <laughs> still play a part you know and do do my oh, yeah well my you're part, helping so. helping other breeders so i get their seeds out man that's fucking awesome it's mad props yeah there's a lot of people that are getting into it or that are falling into it uh, as I don't, I don't know if it's decriminalization or legalization, 
gets more popular in the States here, but um, it's definitely leading to a larger community and there's a lot more interest and a lot, a lot more seed companies now than there used to be. That's for sure. Um, and people that are, are making seeds. We had a, a Chad Westport from uh, in chat. Shout out to Chad. Uh, I've been lurking. Great episode. Uh, gotta say that seed sorter from Cascadian is sexy as fuck. I seen the comment go by, but I wasn't sure if he was talking about the seed separator or me. So I just kind of let it go by because. Why not both? No. <laughs> probably both. Yeah, probably both. For sure. I mean, For sure if you, both. Yeah. If, if you know Chad. <laughs> Now no, you got to rename them Cascadians own seed separators. <laughs> <laughs> Chad's a good dude though, man. He's, he's got a good heart. Hell yeah. He's a super good dude. Actually shout out to Brendan Russ too. I uh, shouted him out on Fumi show, but I'll shout him out on mine. I've had a chance to go hang out with Brendan Russ the other night uh, and OKC and, um, you know, have a nice little jam session with him and Brendan and some other cool people from uh, Herbage magazine. Uh, so uh, shout out to all those people and uh, yeah we'll, we'll have all kinds of cool fun things coming on I just finished moving and uh, have all kinds of cool fun stuff now that we're getting a little more settled certainly if anyone's in the o OKC uh, area hit me up uh, we'll have a good time uh, what's new with you Fumi I know you've been working hard on your website and getting a lot of new cool stuff going yeah, pretty much that. Uh, ironically, I still can't figure out how to organize the photos into folders, but uh, that that has eluded me yet. Uh, but uh, one of these days, I'll conquer that too. So I have uh, photos, beans. Uh, pardon me. Say it again. Why don't you share share your site? Oh, sure. Uh, folks, go take a look at. Uh, by the way, Steve was talking about Velifer. People were like, "Oh my god, what was that again?" Uh, I should probably go to my website before I actually start sharing. Uh, folks, go look at uh, this page right here. Fumid Come on, that page right there. Fumidoro Seed Co. Uh, you can also go look at fumesofgold.com. They go to the same place. You can go look at uh, fun stuff like uh, we know him, the West Engine Swindle. This was his idea. You guys can blame him for it. Uh, three packs for uh, uh, 75 bucks a pack. Now I'm in full infomercial, Steve. Uh, full infomercial mode. Steve, you freaking <laughs> did it for me. Uh, go check out Morgana, Dread Persephone, some fun shit over there. But, uh, you know, I'm proud of it. What can I tell you? Uh, go take a look at the photos. Uh, these are actually like, this is fun. This is like drop ship from Brooklyn. So you got to be like, hey. No sleep till Brooklyn. I don't know. Fuck. Beastie Boys, whatever. Anyway, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, go check it out. I'm going to stop infomercializing. He has some of the sexiest pictures like, no, on no. any breeder website. I'm see, not gonna lie. You see. Some incredible I mean, just look at this. Look at the dude. If Jeff Bezos had a dick cool. rocket, look at this. Look at this right here. Like, look at the. That is a that's a sexy trike, and that trichome is reflecting the uh, pistols over there. So that's a that's a heck oh, of a trichome cool. right there, right? What would you prefer to look at, Jeff Bezos' dick missile or that? Personally, I would look at that. Oh, Unless God. you're Jeff Bezos. That you know what I mean? Jeff Bezos' dick missile. I would say that too, actually. Yeah, I would say that. Like, for example, uh, or even Cuvée. This is a nice one. <laughs> well, it's loading slowly. What? Uh, here's a question. Uh, uh, I, uh, Fumador, do you grow any vegetables? I used to. Not this year. But uh, I used to be really quite into it. Uh, I'm going to be into it again. Uh, I... Why my website is not closing again? I actually want to get really back into uh, uh, hot peppers and stuff, and I think that there's um, kind of a natural. Uh, uh, well, first of all, they grow in the same climate, so it's really really easy to to kind of cohabitate peppers and stuff with uh, cannabis. Uh, I learned firsthand though that peppers can succumb to uh, uh, rose aphids basically, and since then I basically got a little bit. Uh, I, I had a plumber that had to come through, basically had to come through the grow and just apparently accidentally rubbed up against some rose. I happened to know that that rose had some aphids. I guess the guy, even though he was careful, rubbed some up against uh, some of my pepper plants, obliterated my pepper plants. And actually, since then, I've just been cautious and, and, and not worried about it. But in the meantime, now that I know that, I can you know predict for it in the future. But anyway. I'd like to, honestly, okay. now that I say it, I'd like to actually co-plant, honestly, in beds and stuff. Anyway, go ahead. 
if you get into some of the, the pepper breeding groups and some of the mm. grow room pepper grow room groups they rival some of the highest mm. end cannabis growers. Oh, yeah. I mean, yep. there, there's one group, facebook group i'm in and they're honest to god probably 85 percent of that group has nicer grow rooms than most cannabis growers wow <laughs> i've but seen some fun setups them. yeah go ahead but there are also people that understand the whole like line breeding and like all the work mm. that goes into creating strains and pepper like uh, it's, it's same thing with the pumpkin people, right? Like, because you get one shot per year, they, they understand the value of working those lines hard. Um, it's one of the things I love about, um, especially the, the giant fruit competition people, right? They, they, they ha- kind of have that same kind of care that we, we put into our plants. And one of the things why I, I constantly am looking at their forums as well as the you know, stuff that we all look at as well, just for, for new knowledge. Some of those giant pumpkin seeds are expensive, man. Oh yeah, uh, I usually spend two to four hundred dollars a year on pumpkin seeds if I have a place to grow. <laughs> That's my late night. My late night advice is uh, having one too many beers and ordering stuff either off of rareseeds.com or uh, uh, worldclassseeds.com or one of the other competition <laughs> websites, uh, the the vegetable competition websites. I'll find some cool breeder. I'll, I'll watch a cool video on them and then go buy some of the seeds, and, you know, in an ADD moment or whatever. And, uh, but I never feel bad about it. I have a, a, probably, a, you know, enough to fill multiple suitcases worth of seeds. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything ever happened in terms of, you know, stuff hitting the fan or, you know, a corporate takeover of the ag world, I got all kinds of genetics that I could fall back on. So I don't really feel bad That's about that one. But it's also great for two. I'd love to go to seed swaps and bring not just cannabis seeds, but bring a bunch of cool vegetable seeds that maybe people haven't been turned on to yet that might do really well in their climate. You know, especially if I'm visiting a city and I know kind of roughly what the climate is in that area, I try to bring that kind of stuff with me. I have this dream of like, uh, well, first of all, it'd be nice one day to have, uh, I, I haven't been able to grow cannabis outdoors really. I have like one plant, so like a, a male, but it's just, it, I'm going to cut it down pretty soon, you know, but uh, how do I put this? I have this dream of having just this, uh, even in an indoor space, kind of a, how do I even describe this? An area with, I suppose, an aquaponic setup. I want basically like a flowing water setup in the middle, uh, a variety of flowering plants, as well as cannabis, vegetables, you name it, basically all kind of living together and really more than anything else just for me to sit in there and smoke a joint be like oh my god this is the shit you know all that's missing is tarzan or something you know monkeys wouldn't that be fun yeah you're just sitting there you hear the river i was gonna say that i'm trying to find a good video here on uh that i could reshare um give me a second on um here this one this is a good one so if you guys aren't familiar one of the coolest uh, farms that kind of describes you're talking about is Dutch Bloom's farm is an amazing hybrid yeah, living soil and aquaponics. If, if you haven't seen the full farm, um, it's really cool. He has a stream that he built himself that flows through the center of his patch uh, and it feeds off to all the different sides. It's got separate loops for the fish. He's got a pond at one end and a pond at the other. He's got ducks that live in the middle. It's, it's kind of a truly unique and, and very cool uh, facility. Uh, he also has greenhouses. I know he just built a second and third green or a second greenhouse. I think he's working on a third too. Um, but uh, if you aren't familiar and you want to kind of see that type of living soil, aquaponic, uh, fully kind of ecosystem uh, integrated facility on a multi acre scale that's trying to incorporate kind of both halves of that coin. Um, He's truly unique and and truly amazing on a, on a scale that nobody else really is doing currently. So shout out to Josh if he's watching. And he'll be a speaker again at this year's uh, virtual aquaponic cannabis conference uh, held second weekend in November. Uh, we'll have a whole bunch of cool people speak in there. In fact, let me throw that up here behind me um, just so that we have that plug too. But um, uh, definitely check that out. We have worked really hard this year to get a, quite an incredible range of speakers, uh, you know, uh, significantly more speakers than last year. So uh, we're going to have 8 a.m. to uh, 9 p.m. every day, uh, both days of the conference, and we're potentially working on a day three. So uh, if we can fill the whole day three, we're going to do that as well. So uh, we'll, we'll see what we can look up. So, But we super, super cool stuff that 
I don't want to spoil, but some really freaking cool talks that I'm super excited to learn from. Uh, and we'll leave it at that. We're, we're, we'll be releasing that out over the next two months, uh, starting in September, uh, as far as speakers and, uh, and talks and stuff like that. And super excited too. I mean, it's the second year that we've organized this uh, conference. And uh, I mean, last year was a huge success. We kind of put it together out of um, kind of frustration for lack of high quality information out there that was ac accessible to people, especially with COVID and everything else. People kind of wanted it. We couldn't get together physically. Um, so that, you know, this all kind of came together. Marty and I have been talking, I think this is probably the fourth year uh, that we've talked about doing an aquaponic cannabis conference. Um, and it wasn't until last year where really we kind of had enough speakers that were, you know, on the level where we could host a kind of conference and things like that. And it's really kind of exploded uh, over the last two years. So we're super looking forward to that. The science on it's really kind of progressed significantly. We have people on both sides of the Atlantic uh, growing it. We have people in Bangladesh and Southeast Asia growing commercial aquaponics. Uh, in cannabis, we have people in Africa growing commercial aquaponic cannabis. So, um, you know, we're going to have significantly different speakers than last year with different perspectives and different restrictions on their market. So um, it's going to be uh, really eye opening and very educational. You know, we, I, I don't think I've ever spoken to someone uh, from Bangladesh and we're speaking in you know, one of the speakers is the only commercial aquaponic cannabis producer in Bangladesh. So uh, super, super cool. Again, uh, I'm not going to give away names yet, but we have some really cool speakers uh, that have some really cool science figured out that I have, a, I have the pleasure of speaking to privately that are going to be speaking at the conference. So definitely check that out. And that'll That's be cool, held free, free online on, the, on this YouTube channel, uh, Potent Ponics, uh, for everyone. We do not charge for that conference. Yeah, I remember watching the one last year. It turned out pretty cool. So it'll be exciting to see what you've cooked up again this year. Yeah, I kind of make the conference. I wish I could attend basically. <laughs> the, the panel talk from last year, just to have a number of different uh, commercial cannabis, not just commercial aquaponics, but I think we had, what was it, four or five different uh, commercial aquaponic cannabis growers um, that all did it a little bit differently. You know, we had the you know, a few decoupled systems, we had different types of fish, and just the, the round table that we did was my favorite talk on the, um, on the aquaponic conference last year. So definitely, if you haven't done that, there's like two days worth of content on Steve's channel. Uh, just So we've, ex we've expanded on that this year. So we have a home growers panel, a craft producers panel, and a commercial producers panel. So instead of having one uh, big produ producer panel, we have three producer panels this year. So super excited for that. And again, we, we put a lot of time and effort into the, uh, uh, the conference this year. So really excited about it. Um, is that, um, Wes, what, what type of crops were you growing when you're living in the Caribbean? That's something I've wanted to ask you for quite a while in terms of vegetables and spices and all the rest. You're, you're muted, Russ. We always had pumpkin in the backyard. We had sugar cane. We had soursop. We had uh, guava trees. We had uh, guinnips. We had mangoes on our property. We had all kinds of stuff. We, yeah, cherries. We had tamarinds. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably about it. Awesome. Uh, I, I know I'm a huge soursop, sweet sop, jungle sop fan, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like soursop. I really like soursop. I, I could eat sweet sop every day until I die. Yeah. And golden apple's pretty good, too. Oh, I'm a yeah. Big man. Ma uh, mangoes. Very... Mangoes, too. Good juni mangoes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, anyone that lives in North America doesn't know what a mango is. They haven't had the good ones yet. Yeah. So you go to the tropics, you can get those nice, the stringies and those purple ones, man. So good. Yeah. Alrighty, um, uh, Von Ponix, do you want to uh, mention uh, how people can find you and all your stuff one last time? And then we'll, uh, we'll start to work our, our uh, outros from there. 
Yeah, so if you guys want to check out my channel, if you just go on YouTube, type in Von Ponics, V-O-N-P-O-N-I-C-S, and you can check me out there. I have videos on aquaponics. I'm not an expert, but I'm just showing you my experience, what I'm doing, uh, basically. So if you you can learn something from that, if you like, uh, that's what I'm passionate about. But otherwise, yeah. You got a lot of super awesome content, especially people trying to kind of, you know, build something as they grow, something that's applicable to probably a large percentage of the people watching this episode right now. So uh, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on there. There aren't a lot of people who have a lot of really good content that's a little bit more in depth on the scale that you're doing. Uh, and it is kind of probably the majority of people doing aquaponics currently in terms of scale. So um, shout out to you and all the awesome content you're putting out there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Heck yeah, man. <laughs> um, what about you, Wes Engine? How do people find you and all the awesome stuff you're doing? <laughs> if you can find the mute button. You can, yeah, man, if we can find the mute button. Uh, you can find me over, uh, I hang out on uh, over on Fumi Show. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find me on, on the Chronic Table and Bruise with Buds. Uh, over there uh three days a week yeah um and uh yeah find me find me around he's the guy that we use to yell at uh people who might be underage in the in the show that to get them to fuck off basically spoiler alert yep. it's true I, i'm the one that drinks too much on the show on the drinking shows uh or, define too much do. but also i think yeah like i was looking at the total yesterday and i was like holy balls who how many how many people did i have over because both bottles were new and they're not new anymore for sure yeah. <laughs> we were right there with you yep no it was a good show last night it was a great mm. show mm. got a little toasted yep a little bit i might have sent a couple dms towards the end of the show that i don't even remember sending like i looked <laughs> at it i was like holy shit i said that but yeah, i don't remember should I should I bring up some of the <laughs> the chicane some of the awesome memes from yesterday? Please do. Let me let me find them. Hold on, there we go. This is just a little bit of the, some of the fun from Fumi's show yesterday. <laughs> it was the best fuck these people i swear to god <laughs> uh, and again i don't mean that negatively towards coot we fucking love coot he's fucking awesome um, he man. just has a couple of fun sayings that <laughs> we love to love to mention them um, uh thank you again to von ponix for coming on again we always love to try and um bring you know not just have like last week we had a uh, land race um, preservation society we try to have a, a balance of both um, larger scale breeders and other stuff, but also people that are kind of just getting started. You know, you kind of remind me and Marty a lot of ourselves and we were just getting started in the market, trying to figure out how to balance all the systems and the different types of filtration and all the tinkering, right? Like that's one of the things I miss a lot about doing the commercial side is the tinkering and screwing around and messing with new ideas. And you you kind of do a lot of that stuff on your channel and show people how that plays out over time. And it's one of the things that kind of isn't being done a lot right now in aquaponics. So thanks for putting that content out there. Um, you guys can check out myself over at um, uh, SoundCloud, iTunes. We actually just got joined on to Amazon Music today. So you can find us on there as well. And um, yeah, uh, thanks a lot for watching. Um, we'll see, see you guys again soon. Um, and uh, excuse me, I have a bunch of cool content. Um, I actually have been remastering a couple of the old interviews that I did when I first got started in my career. Um, I actually have a super cool old episode from the Dude Grow Show, episode 49, that I'm gonna be reposting and I got permission from those guys to repost here. Uh, it's an edited version because they had a lot of music back in the early days, if you guys aren't familiar, um, but you guys are gonna get a kick out of some of the stuff I was able to edit in that didn't get filtered by YouTube's algorithm. So uh, uh, I think you guys are going to be stoked on that. So uh, check that out. And then we have a bunch of cool new stuff. I have a series on some disease guides that we're going to be putting out for free on the YouTube channels. So check that out. We have a bunch of cool new interview uh, snippets where we, uh, again, chopped out the interviews with some old episodes that haven't quite uh, been exposed to some of the newer listeners. And a bunch of cool new content. And if you're in Oklahoma, um, we got some super amazing concentrate we'll be dropping on you the second half of September. So uh, um you know, be on the lookout. And uh, that's all I'm going to say. Um, thanks, everybody for watching. Uh, we'll see you guys again next week. 
Um, be sure to check out Fumi's show on Saturday. Uh, actually, I'll let him plug it. To, uh, uh, what it Thank you. To play uh, us out to end the show. Absolutely. Why not? Do I, I even have music? Like I have like copyright free music that I could totally play. Hold on. Which one? Would we, uh, we could pick this one. This is very cultural. Uh, oh, wait, that's something I was thinking about, but hopefully it works. Isn't that classy? Holy shit, is that classy? And ladies and gentlemen, for that classiness and more, that's probably too loud. Uh, I can't promise that there will be music on the show, but uh, <laughs> we could pretend. We could pretend there will be music. Ladies and gentlemen, come and listen to the smooth sounds of... <laughs> we're going to be doing a bruise and buds, my friends. Uh, no, we are not only exclusively alcoholic-themed show. I realize that it sounds like that because yesterday we were drinking like fish and Saturday we are drinking like... It's not actually meant to be, but uh, folks, hop on uh, if you are into like a craft beer. Isn't that classy with that music? I mean, honestly, uh, if you're into craft beer, craft tea, craft coffee, whatever else, or just honestly, just enjoy hanging, uh, come by and join us. A uh, few more of the flavors on uh, YouTube. Look at this. Yeah, this few, few of our shows, especially on Saturdays, it's kind of like hanging out at the bar with a bunch of grower friends. That's uh, kind of how I like to describe it. So, oh, a little smooth, jazzy, but that's how you know that it's classic. Yeah, you know what I mean. Kenny G could pop out of the corner, basically. Like that's how you know. That's how you know. <laughs>